Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Thursday, July 18th, and I thought I would do a drop-in support group meeting because we've got a couple of unexpected product reveals to do. So normally we do these support group meetings uh, twice a month scheduled. That's the first and third Sunday of every month at 12.30 Pacific time, 3.30 uh, Eastern Standard time. Um, and then I like to do drop-in meetings too. So it is time to do a meeting. Normally, guys, just want you to know we simulcast on Facebook and YouTube. If I'm looking up here, I'm looking at Facebook. If I'm looking down here, I'm looking at YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Now, you guys, for anybody who's never been here before, this is a real support group meeting. This is not for comedy. This is not for fun. These are patients who are struggling. They're in pain. They're looking for help. They're looking for education. They're looking for information. All right. So we take these really, really seriously. I am the national IC support group leader. I've been an IC support group leader for 25 years. I've got three college degrees, degree in chemistry, degree in pharmacology, drug development, and a graduate degree in psychology. And I could not do my PhD because I, in fact, was injured. Uh, ironically, the IC network was my doctoral dissertation proposal. So you know what? 25 years later, hey, it's still working. Hello, Karen. Hello, Elise. It's nice to see you. Hello, Facebook. It's nice to see you guys too. Now, I know Facebook has changed their algorithm and they're not displaying live feeds like they used to, which really, really sucks eggs as usual. Here, hold on a sec. Let me just get this computer. I couldn't start earlier because I had a dentist appointment this morning. No cavities. Woohoo. <laughs> hi, Jenny. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Laura. Hi, Ravonda. Hey, uh, for those of you that are on, hi, DB. Uh, for those of you on Facebook, could you please post on your uh, in your IC groups and also on your feed that, that, that I've gone live with the support group meeting? Um, we're getting very close to switching over to Twitch anyway, but because I'll be able to do a lot more things like screen shares and things like that. So guys, come on now, it's summer. How are you feeling? How is life? How is your IC today? I'd love to hear how you're doing. My IC is pretty good. Not feeling my bladder at all. Been getting up, uh, although I did get up twice last night, which is really unusual for me. And I think I'm going to blame it on, what did I, uh, I made fajitas last night um, and I put a little bit of vinegar something in there that might have got, might have gotten my bladder a little bit, but I don't feel it today. Now, and also uh, let me know how the sound is and things like that. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Christine. Chris Karen says, just getting over a flare. Yeah, man, I'm telling you. What is it about the midsummer blues? I'm telling you, it, you, you got to feel bad for those kids who get colds in the middle of the summer or worse, you know, those of us, it probably happened to all of us, where you eat something you're not supposed to eat and you end up with IBS for a couple of days or gastritis. That was just typical for me earlier. Hi, Christine. Hi, Tamara. She says, well, you're a breath of fresh air today. Hi from Iowa, where it's over 100 degrees. Girl. Yeah, I think it's about 90 degrees here. It's crazy. All right. So um, uh, I have a couple of reveals to do for you guys today. And the first reveal is, gosh, which one to do? God, I'm really excited about this. Oh, you know what? Let's do this. Um, no, let's do this. One. Okay. So um, our latest magazine, The IC Optimist, is out. And uh, this is a special double issue um, because uh, uh, I had to do that thing for Harvard Medical School this spring. So I could not do a spring, a separate spring in summer. It was just way too much work for me. So what we did is a special double issue the, of the IC Optimist. And in this magazine, um, really the hot thing right now on the, on the Internet is really the role of infection in IC. Now, you know, I mean, guys, seriously, I go back to the days before Facebook, the days before Twitter, back when the internet was fresh and new and we had America Online, CompuServe, and internet news groups. 
And if you go back to those original discussions, you will see that the role of infection in, in IC was the hot topic. And, you know, there's kind of this perception that, that the internet is really worse today, that people are really me meaner today than they were before. Oh, let me set you straight here. Those old internet news groups for IC were brutal. Absolutely. You have never seen such warfare on the internet as these big discussions about bacteria. And because there was no accountability, no supervision, anything like that, man, I'm telling you, you what you see today is mild compared to what we went through, you know, in the early days. It's crazy. So the, so the real question is, is IC caused by infection or not? Now, you all know that we have subtyping now, right? I mean, a one treatment fits all approach does not work. Why? Because there's many variations of IC. We know for some people, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after menopause. Is it the same? Absolutely not. For some people, IC begins after, after uh, uh, going through chemotherapy. For others, IC begins after having a baby. Are they the same? Absolutely not. And 20 years ago, yeah, we all really thought of IC as a, quote, incurable disease of the bladder. We don't think that anymore. And if you go back 40, 50, 60 years ago, and you look at those early, early papers about IC, one of the things you see is they all talked about muscles so tight, they were like tight piano strings. And so it was about 15 years ago, I'm going to say that the muscle advocates started Making having success entering this rigid IC community, uh, you know, kind of that upper echelon National Institutes of Health. Um, and very quickly, we had a research study that showed that pelvic floor physical therapy was helpful for IC, right? So we don't think of IC as an incurable disease of the bladder anymore. We think of it more as a syndrome. We think of it as a bladder pain syndrome or a pelvic pain syndrome. And Every country now around the world is doing their own kind of version of subtyping. Uh, in the U.S., we don't have an agreed upon system of subtyping. I'm going to tell you right now that the United States IC system is incredibly conservative. And, and uh, man, they really mull stuff over before they embrace stuff. So we don't have national consensus on a formal subtyping system here in the United States. However, however, I use the subtyping system that was created at, uh, by Chris Payne, who ran the IC research program at Stanford University. And if you've been to any of these lectures before, then you know that uh, you know this already. So we, he, fo he focuses on five variants, and I promise I'm going to get to infection. Variant number one, Hunter's lesions. If you've got a bladder covered with big, giant open wounds, if you've got Hunter's lesions, then you are a unique entity because when we biopsy a lesion, it is profoundly different than everyone else. Lesions are filled with um, inflammation. There is a massive inflammatory process happening in people who have lesions. Whereas somebody without lesions, you do a biopsy of a typical IC bladder, petechial hemorrhage is in an IC bladder, you don't see inflammation to this degree. Inflammation, of course, means your body's fighting something. So here's a picture of Hunter's lesions. Hunter's lesions are characterized by having a center lesion and then arms that spread out from it, right? So this is a really good picture right here. Big center lesion and then arms kind of going from that. Everyone in the world agrees that this is its own unique syndrome disease. Actually, we're just gonna say right out, this is its own unique disease. Surprisingly, researchers in Europe made a really big breakthrough because they discovered that um, these patients have virus in their urine and not just one virus. We know that the polyoma BK virus is found often in the urine of patients with lesions. Polyoma BK has long been associated with hemorrhagic cystitis. Polyoma BK is a virus that we all have. It is normally silent. However, it gets turned on in people who are immune compromised. So if somebody has, is going through a kidney transplant, they've got to have their immune system suppressed. 
Or if uh, somebody has HIV or they're really severely, severely immune compromised, we know that that polyoma BK virus can turn on in the bladder wall and cause hemorrhagic cystitis. What are Hunter, Hunter's lesions known for? A waterfall-like appearance of bleeding. When you stretch a lesion, it bleeds profusely. So getting back to our question, is I see the result of infection? Well, yes. For these patients, there could very well be a viral infection at the heart of that lesion. And interestingly, you know, despite the research studies, I was um, uh, engaged with uh, some really good uh, Twitter discussions this week with Dr. James Malone Lee out of the United Kingdom, as well as a few others, including somebody who's working with, working on the virome. So we've got the biome, which is, or, or we've got the, uh, the, the bacterial biome, and then there's the fungisome or something like that. And now they're also trying to identify the virome. What is the normal load of virus in the bladder? You know, because again, guys, remember, urine is not sterile. The bladder is not sterile. There are things living in the bladder successfully and appropriately. All right. So question number one is, could IC be the result of a viral infection? Yeah. If you've got Hunter's lesions, we've got research that suggests that. And the last research study was a year ago, which connected Epstein-Barr to some of these patients. Now, again, in this Twitter discussion I was having, it was like, all right, so we got the research. Has, is anybody at all exploring treatment for these patients? And the answer is no, not yet. That research is just beginning. And I've just gotten on a, uh, I've made some really good new contacts in the industry to, to really stay abreast of this. This is exciting, okay? I see subtype two is bladder wall driven. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after some sort of direct bladder wall issue or trauma. We know your bladder wall is driving your symptoms. If you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. So here's a picture of a typical wounded bladder. See, now it looks very different from a lesion. We call these petechial hemorrhages or glomerulations. So think about it. You've got these on your bladder wall. If, you're, if your bladder fills with urine, urine cups, covers up, gets into these wounds, the fuller you get, the worse you feel by far. And then as soon as you pee and empty, you feel much better. So if you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination, that's going to point us to your bladder wall. So the question then is, what can be triggering the bladder wall? Well, you know, you got to remember that the bladder, like any other part of the body, it can be injured, easily injured. How is it injured? It is injured through chemical exposure. So if we look, for example, at uh, chemotherapy, we call it chemocystitis. Ke patients going through chemo are well known to get bladder irritation. Um, if you were a big diet soda drinker, big soda drinker, you didn't drink water, all you did is you drank soda and coffee and bolt and all that sort of stuff, you know, your bladder is not designed to hold large levels of acid like that over time. You got to remember, your body was designed for like thousands of years ago. Your bladder has a threshold as to what it can tolerate. And when you exceed that threshold, you're in terms of acid or stimulation or irritation, you're going to trigger bladder injury. Now, the second thing that we're really going to look at when somebody who has pain as their bladder fills, that is relieved by urination, is their age and their estrogen levels. Because your bladder is like your mouth. It is a hollow organ covered with mucus. And it is that nice, thick mucosal barrier that protects the cells of your bladder from whatever's in your urine. Remember, urine is body waste. It contains ammonia and urea and all the chemical byproducts that your body's trying to get rid of sits in your urine, including if you're a smoker, all those carcinogens. All those carcinogens end up in your urine. And, and if you don't pee regularly, if you're one of those people, you know, there's always a group of people who don't pee all day. You're literally leaving cancer causers next to your bladder wall over time. 
So that's why cigarette smoking is the number one cause of bladder cancer. Now, let me just say right here, IC is not associated with cancer at all. However, if you're a smoker, you definitely want to get something called a urine cytology test just to rule it out, just to rule it out. Okay, so if you have had a hysterectomy, if your hormones are unusual, if you're on birth control, if you're menopausal, if you're postmenopausal, anything that causes your estrogen levels to drop are going is going to impact the overall health and functioning of your bladder. Okay. So we call it the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. When you have less estrogen, you have less coding, which means your bladder is more vulnerable. And it was interesting earlier this week, man, I, I, I don't know if it was Monday or Tuesday, like every woman I talked with, if they were a GSM patient, they never heard about it. It's like, yeah, estrogen matters. And it's also interesting too, the number of patients who are given an estrogen cream and never use it because they don't understand the appropriate of it, appropriateness of it. Okay, the third thing that we're gonna look at, and I see you on YouTube. I, I just can't stop what I'm doing, but hi. <laughs> Okay, the third thing that we have to talk about in this subtype is, in fact, chronic infection. Because now we're not going to paint a, braid, a broad brush and say that everybody has infection like we did 20 years ago on the Internet news groups. That's not true. We have variants. But is there a, subtet, a subset of patients who have chronic infection? Sure. And the National Institutes of Health here, excuse me, I'm sitting on my uh, my funky my funky stool right now. Um, if you haven't seen this before, anybody who has trouble sitting, it's pretty cool, you know, because it moves and stuff. I like it. All right. So can patients have chronic infection? Absolutely. But the question is the type of infection. As an example, we know, for example, that if you have Lyme disease, researchers have found the Lyme bacteria, Borrelia, in the bladder wall. And that is why we always suggest anybody who lives in a high Lyme state, or if you're a hiker, if you've ever been bitten by ticks, have a Lyme test. Have a Lyme test. Why not? I mean, because remember, you're trying to rule stuff out. We are trying to get to the bottom of what is triggering your pain. And getting that Lyme screen is reasonable. Hi, Pauline from Canada. Hi, Leela from Southern California. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Kim. Hi, Mary. Hi, JJ. Okay, let me finish this little thing and then I'll take your questions. So, uh, so number one, Lyme disease is possible. Number two, fungal infection is possible. Candida infections are possible. Now, how do we know that? Because our own National Institutes of Health proved it. The MAP Research Network, the multidisciplinary approach to the study of pelvic pain, did a they're the ones who over the last decade have been exhaustively researching IC and chronic prostatitis. And they're the ones who found candida in the urine of patients who are flaring. And, and seriously, that shouldn't come as any surprise because number one, if there's a group of patients massively overexposed to antibiotics, it's us. Seriously, I double dog dare anybody in, in, in this event. Right now we've got uh, 50, 51 patients watching, okay? Has anybody here not been prescribed antibiotics? The answer is no. They always throw antibiotics at you. Hello, Barbara from Australia. It's nice to see you. So if anybody's going to be at risk of fungal infection, it is going to be the IC patient community because we have been massively overtreated with antibiotics over time. And hey, dudes, you got to be real here. Every single one of you have in all likelihood, a prescription of antibiotics in your bedside table, just in case, right? Just in case you get a wicked flare, feels like infection, you're gonna slam that antibiotic down even though you don't have any proof that it's infection. 
So, um, and then of course, there absolutely is a group of women, postmenopausal women, who get recurring UTIs. Okay, why? Well, again, they don't have a lot of protection in their vagina and or in their bladder that would uh, make it difficult for bacteria to colonize them. Bacterial vaginosis is common in a menopausal woman, postmenopausal woman. Um, and there's that small group of patients who really do get proof positive, confirmed infections every month. So the question then is, what is that infection? What is that infection? And that's really where the debate right now is fascinating. If you go over onto Twitter, you guys follow me on Twitter. I'm ICN Jill. ICN Jill on Twitter. We have a group of people from Australia who are very, very passionate about the role of bacteria in IC symptoms and in UTI and who are really jumping appropriately on the bandwagon that traditional urine testing is ineffective. Okay, and we all know that. We all know a typical urine culture, uh, number one, will only identify 5% of the potential bacteria that live in your bladder wall, but it also tends to be quite inaccurate. Um, and so you've got this group and, and this group of advocates really resurrecting this discussion of, of bacteria and IC. And then you've got a lovely man, Dr. James Maloney, a retired, uh, retired uh, doctor from the United Kingdom who has specialized in cystitis. His career was dedicated to cystitis. He's got over 180 published uh, research studies and journal articles on it. He joined Twitter last December, and he is adding his voice to this discussion. And, and based upon his results with his research, he believes that, here, hold on, I'll give you his findings. So we're got, you guys, we're going over our latest magazine, The Icy Optimist, uh, which was released this week. We had a little printing error, so it was delayed for two weeks. They made a big mistake with it, so we had to reprint. Okay, so hold on a sec. Let me just, let me get this for a second. So here we've got Dr. James Maloney, who based upon his research, he believes, quote, that typical urine tests miss many genuine infections. Number two, the dipstick tests uh, are substantially worse than culture methods and that he said he believes they should no longer be used to exclude infection. He believes the best way to find infection is to look at urine under a microscope. That if you if you pee in a cup, they need to prep it appropriately, look at it under a microscope, and if they see pus, if they see white blood cells, that is kind of proof positive that something's going on there, potentially. He believes that many people with lower urinary tract symptoms are living with chronic infections that go untreated because of contemporary guidelines, typical UTI guidelines. Uh, he believes that many urine infections are caused by mixed colonies and mixed growth, so not the same bacteria, different types of bacteria. We know that that's true because biofilms, bacterial biofilms, are what we call heterogeneous popul populations of bacteria. It's not the same bacteria living in a biofilm. It's a really diverse group of bacteria that lives there. And that many urine infections involve the intracellular bacterial colonization of the urothelium by mixed pathogens that are fastidious and difficult to treat. Okay. And you know who was the first to, first to talk about fastidious infections was Dr. Fugazzato 20 years ago. Paul Fugazzato, also known as Dr. Fuzzy. He was the one doing broth cultures. And he believed that, that fastidious bacterial uh, infections were at part of the cause of IC. Now, last month in the Washington Post, a really good article was published that shared the story of a, quote, IC patient who they were able to, they were, they were able to determine actually had 
a fastidious infection and with long-term antibiotic treatment, she was healed. It's absolutely possible that some of you, not all of you, some of you could have chronic infection. However, <laughs> however, in response to that article in the Washington Post, Dr. Rob Moldwin, the author of the IC Survival Guide and the ICA Board of Directors, got a letter to the editor in the Washington Post in which they took great exception to that article and basically said that long-term antibiotic therapy could be quite damaging to patients. That is absolutely true. Um, and that the research doesn't back up the claim that I see as a result for some of you of fastidious infection. So it's like, who the hell are you supposed to believe? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, you can see both sides. I mean, the, the concept of a fastidious infection in some of you identified by potentially next generation DNA testing. And we have had people in these meetings who have done the next generation DNA urine testing. They find a bacteria, they treat it, and they are massively improved. Then you've got some of you who do next gen testing. You don't know how to interpret the results. You try it and it doesn't work. The flaw here, I think the great challenge in Dr. Malone's approach that I don't really understand is that if you can't rely on urine testing to identify the correct bacteria, and you can't rely on urine testing to do uh, to get provide good antibiotic sensitivity testing results then how do you know how to treat it so you have pus on it on a you know uh, that you see under a microscope the assumption is the infection but you you can't identify the infection so do you just guess and are we going back to the old broad spectrum antibiotics that destroy the whole biome? Or I think as he said in one of his articles, they do a very narrow targeted long-term long antibiotic. And we got a long way to go in this. And then we've got to deal with the reality that's, that when you take a lot of antibiotics, you're going to get candida. You're going to get candida. You're, you're going to abrupt, abruptly change your normal biome, that normal population of bacteria, which control the good bacteria versus bad bacteria for the fungus. When you take an antibiotic for a long period of time, you're destroying everything, including the good bacteria, and you're creating the perfect environment for fungus and candida to grow. So again, who the hell do you believe? This is why subtyping is so good. This is why subtyping is so good. Because what it does is it gives you a checklist of things to rule out. I believe that the chronic infection patient is a very small population of the IC, of the IC community. Is it possible? Absolutely. I've said it's possible for years. However, If you've gone through chemotherapy and you have bladder irritation, that's not from a bacteria. That's from the irritating effects of the chemo. If you were a diet soda drinker, a coffee drinker, that's not infection. That's an irritation from the acid and the caffeine of those drinks. The bladder, remember, the bladder only knows one language, frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. Everything feels like infection. You could have a bullet wound and it would feel like infection. You could have a stab wound, it would feel like infection. You could have cancer and it would feel like infection. That's the only language that the bladder has to tell you that's a problem. So I know that it's really easy to think, gosh, it must be infection. But for many of you, it's not. It's injury or trauma. It's injury or trauma. Okay, I see subtype three, pelvic floor driven. These are the muscle injury patients. 
So these are the patients whose symptoms began after having a car accident, a fall, having a baby, a rape, sexual abuse, extreme athletics, a long history of athletics, a long history of falling. I was working with a patient yesterday who um, has had symptoms for 40 years. And we were going over kind of everything. I was trying to subtype her over the phone, you know, kind of, sort of. And it was like, I was like, I kept focusing her back. Your symptoms began when you were in your 20s. What happened in your 20s? Can you remember anything that happened? And she had had a really bad fall. And I think that that was the foundation for for her muscle dysfunction that she thought was bladder, but a trip to the pelvic floor physical therapist proved that she had really, really bad muscles. I worked with one patient whose muscles were like concrete, hard, hard, hard lockdown muscles. And remember when you got tight muscles, it restricts blood flow to the bladder and it's very hard for the bladder to be healthy. You know, that's why our therapeutic priority for somebody with pelvic floor is to restore blood flow. We're not going to do that with the medication. We're going to do that with pelvic floor physical therapy. I see subtype four is pudendal neuralgia. This is a nerve injury. So these are the patients whose symptoms are positional in nature. You're fine when you stand, but when you sit down, it hurts. When you bend over, it hurts. When you sit on the side of your bed. The thing about PE that's so interesting is generally PE patients sleep really well. They don't get up to pee at night. Their symptoms are tend to be very, very driven by movement, by certain positions. Because think about it this way. So here, I mean, this is a really bad example, but here's a muscle. And here's, let's see, here's a nerve going across this muscle, right? So if this muscle locks down, if this muscle locks down on that nerve, that's going to compromise and compromise that nerve. And that's what happens when you bend down. That's what happens when you bend over or you sit down or you lay on your left side or you lay on your left side. For patients with PNE, uh, it's usually positioning. And the therapy really is to get to the cause of why that nerve is being entrapped. And usually it's tight muscles, but therapeutically, they're also gonna be doing things that are gonna calm nerves down. Like as an example, neuromodulation, or gabapentin neuron, things like that. I see subtype five is central sensitization. This is the inherited subtype. It's the, this is my subtype. Every woman in my family going back three generations has this. So what does central sensitization mean? It means that the nerves throughout our body have a lower threshold. They're easier to turn on. Characterized by extremely sensitive skin. We tend to be drug sensitive. We can't take a normal dose of a medication. We got to take a quarter dose, a half dose, you know, a medication. We tend to be incredibly food sensitive. Like for me, I can't eat oatmeal and I can't eat chocolate. It just destroys me. I was fine as a kid, but something happened at the age of 23 and bam, it all got turned on. We have a wicked sense of smell. Like I was at the dentist today getting my teeth, uh, teeth cleaned and and as she was starting and she was looking at my teeth, I was going, you know, your, your gloves smell. She goes, what? And I go, yeah, they smell like Vaseline. They smell like old Vaseline. And she pulled her, she pulled it back and she smelled it. And she goes, kind of. And she went and got a new pair, put them in my mouth. I went, yeah, those smell too. And uh, I mean, that's kind of what happens when you've got a really wicked sense of smell. You smell things to a much greater degree than other people. That's one of the reasons why people with central sensitization are really good in certain in certain professions like winemaker, making uh, anything that involves sense. We're really good at. Um, um, and we are wickedly chemically sensitive, extremely chemically sensitive. So from fabric softener to detergents to scented candles to all that crap like that, that doesn't work well with us. When you have an appointment at a doctor and a doctor says in advance, please don't wear perfume, they're doing that for a reason. People get sick with, from that. People, For people who are sensitive, smells trigger pain. They trigger pain. It's freaky weird, but it is. Okay, so we got these five core subtypes, right? So let's get back to our question. Is IC caused by infection? 
not for everybody. You cannot put infection, all your eggs in the infection basket is simply not true. But for some of you, it's possible. And that is why during your, during your diagnostic workup, we want to rule that stuff out. If you've been exposed to ticks, why not have a Lyme disease test? I don't know a doctor who would say no. Do it. If you're curious, you can have a next generation test, next generation DNA test of your urine, $199. Will it give you interesting information? Absolutely, it could, it could. The nice thing about the next generation testing, there's two things that I like about it. I like number one, that it'll identify fungus. A typical urine test will not identify fungus. And it will give you any antibiotic resistance genes. Um, and that is incredibly important. Now, Emily here on Facebook says, could having endo removed from the bladder cause damage to the bladder wall? Absolutely. In fact, in our magazine, we have an article this summer about bladder endometriosis. And endometriosis can be on the surface of the bladder or it can move in into the bladder wall. Right? So we do have an article on bladder endometriosis in our latest magazine. Guys, you can sign up for this magazine on the IC Network website at $25 for uh, four issues for the year. And it supports these live chats. If you want it mailed to you, it's $50. All right. So um, now I just want to say one other thing. There's a lot of heat right now about next generation urine testing. You know, some doctors hate it. Some doctors love it. Some doctors say it's not useful because, because you don't know how to interpret the results. Other doctors say it's incredibly useful. I, uh, Dr. Malone Lee, as an example, is somebody who doesn't really like next generation testing. He doesn't think the data is that meaningful because he says, even if it tells you what bacteria are living in your urine, it doesn't tell you which one might be triggering your symptoms. It might give you a list of seven bacteria, but it doesn't necessarily tell you which one is the problem. And that's fair. That's fair. We don't really know what a normal biome is. We don't. Um, but I asked him, I said, but isn't one of the key benefits of DNA testing the, identif the identification of fungal infections and uh, antibiotic res resistant genes? And he said, yes. Yeah. So there's a place for it. But other people are feeling they're t kind of sorry, they're, they're kind of talking it down. I don't know. You know what, guys? Seriously, I just like facts. I like facts, man. You got to rule stuff out. And so, so we know that IC symptoms can be caused by a problem with the bladder. We know that IC symptoms can be caused by a problem with the muscles. We know that IC symptoms can be caused by problems with nerves. And we know that IC can be inherited and or the result of traumatic injury. And when you go to the doctor, it's very, very, very important that you not walk in and say, hey, I've been diagnosed with IC. Please do not do that. Because you're going to walk, you're going to we, we force down what I call the rabbit hole. Instead, I want you to go in and say, doctor, I am here to trigger to figure out this symptom. So, and then you've got to describe the symptoms. So do you have a pulling discomfort, a pushing discomfort? Do you have pain as your bladder fills? Do you have pain after urination? Do you have pain when you sit in a certain position? Do you have pain after sex? Your ability to describe your unique symptoms is critical here. For God's sake, don't be one of those people who says, I've got pain down there. It's useless. That's absolutely useless. I need you to be able to describe your pain. Is it inside of your body or outside of your body? That's question number one. Is it high? Is it deep or low? Is it all the time or is it episodic? Does it come and go? What makes you feel better? What makes you feel worse? So as an example, I was working with a patient yesterday who um, uh, I asked her. So it was one of those cases where she was having some bladder wall issues and she was clearly having pelvic floor issues. And I said to her, I said, what makes you feel better? 
Does drinking water make you feel better? No. What, what do you do to feel better? She goes, heat. And I said, okay, what does heat do? She goes, I'm not sure. I said, it relaxes muscles. So wouldn't it be interesting to have a discussion with your doctor about a muscle relaxant or a vaginal valium suppository to see how that is. We know that Tarlov cysts on the spinal cord can cause symptoms of IC. We know that fibroid tumors pressing on the bladder can cause symptoms of IC. We know that endometriosis can attach to the bladder. We also know, now you guys, I mean, the absolute most fascinating case that, I, that I've worked with this year was with a, a retired doctor who had bladder pain and she was a runner. And so she knew something was wrong and she went to the, and she started noticing pain and frequency and urgency as she was running. She went to the doctor. They couldn't find anything wrong with her. She had all the tests. They couldn't find anything wrong with her at all. And uh, they kind of gave her that it's all in your head hint. And so she went, you know, she didn't really know what to do. It wasn't her area of expertise. Got worse got worse. She couldn't run. Then she couldn't walk. Then she could barely move. Then one day in the bathroom while she was peeing, she had to push a little bit. You know what popped out? Stitches. An inch long series of blue polypropylene stitches popped out of her body through her bladder. <laughs> She's like, you know, and she felt it. It's like, what the hell is that? She looks in the toilet. Holy hell, there's stitches. What? There's stitches? Didn't make any sense to her. She felt massively better. After she passed the stitches and she accidentally flushed them down, she felt massively better. A couple months later, she got worse again. Worse and worse and worse and worse. Here. Oh, I can't answer this. I'm sorry. Let's just let that go. You're hearing this over my computer. Stop! I don't know how to turn it off. Okay, there you go. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so her pain got worse. One day she strained a little bit, out popped loose stitches, right? Got better. A couple months later, got worse again. Got much, much worse. Much, 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 much worse. And then, bam, uh, they did a uh, laparotomy exploratory, and her belly was filled with stitches. Here, hold on. Hey, I'm doing a live chat. I can't talk right now, but I can call you later, okay? All right. So, you know, so she was like, hey, have you ever, have you ever heard of this before? And I went, Believe it or not, yes, because it's happened to one other patient. It turned out in her case, she had had a tummy tuck 20 years earlier after having a baby. And she remembered that she let an intern do it. It was, it was, you know, because she was a doctor, she believed in training other doctors. And what happened is the intern used the wrong stitches. Polypropylene stitches were never meant to be used deep inside the body. They're meant to be used on the surface. Whoever did that surgery did it on the did it on the inside. And so when they went and opened her up, she was filled with blue polypropylene stitches floating through her belly. And what was happening is they were attaching to tissue and working their way through tissue. And we know polypropylene does that because polypropylene mesh did that. For all the mesh con controversies out there, we knew that patients who had uh, vaginal suspensions, prolapse surgery using meshes, we knew that that polypropylene mesh had the potential of cutting across the urethra. It moves and it's hard and it's firm and it's covered with bacteria. That's the, amaz um, the most amazing thing about that. So as you are on your journey here to try to figure out what is triggering your pain, 
guys, we got to look outside the box. You got to look outside the bladder. There are other potential things that can also be causing this pain. All right, let's take some of your questions. Oh, uh, oh, 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 wait, I can't do that yet. Oh my God, like I totally forgot the most important thing. <laughs> Look at what has arrived. You're seeing it here first, got it last night, Piora. So, many of you should remember when we summarized the research that was presented at the American Urology Association uh, a month ago, it is that PEA, poly, palmitoethanolamide, uh, we had a new research study produced by the Italians testing PEA with IC pain. And the data was stunning, stunningly good, that at three months, 87% 80, uh, of patients had a significant reduction of pain. At six months, 100% of patients had a significant reduction of their pain, and 25% were pain-free. And these were patients not responding to other therapies. And so when this study was presented at the American Urology Association, everybody got very, very excited. The doctors got very, very excited. Interestingly, the company that makes Bladder Builder uh, natural Approach Nutrition was already working on this. They were already working on this. PEA is in Bladder Builder, okay? But we wanted to have a formula that, that mimicked the formula in the research study, that is as close as we can get to the formula in the research study, and it's here, Piora. There were no side effects reported in that research study. Um, uh, and the data was was incredibly promising. And to me, the reason why I decided to jump on this bandwagon fairly quickly is because so many of you have been taken off of your pain meds. And if there's even a remote chance that this might help reduce your pain and make and minimize your suffering, to me, that makes sense. And so Piora is the first US produced PEA product. And it is exclusive from the IC network because it's something that we've been working on. Best of all is the price. It's under $30. That's my goal here. You know, as I'm, you know, now that Sister Protec has gone to hell in a house hand basket, one of the things that ha continues to has continued to frustrate me about every all these therapies is how expensive they are. And so whenever I'm working with companies, I, I'm saying flat out, man, we got to make it affordable. And I'm really, really happy that we're keeping this under $30. It's $29.99. And if, we, if it takes off, we'll be able to reduce the price even more. But we have our first 500 bottles over on the IC network in our shop. So anybody who wants to try this, this is available. All right. It's, it's, it's an option. It's an option, okay? All righty then. So let's uh, let's take some of your questions, my my good IC brothers and sisters. Patricia, is, have you have you heard of a a Bart for treating Lyme? No, I haven't. I'm not a Lyme person at all. I don't know anything about it, Patricia. I'm sorry. April shares that she has C diff, uh, uh, which you get you get C diff from taking too many antibiotics, and then you've got to treat those with more antibiotics. It's like holy hell, we're stuck in this, this thing with antibiotics. Okay, you guys know on Facebook, just know please that it won't let me scroll back, and so I know some of you have asked questions and I can't read them, so please ask them again. Mari says, I don't understand why there are meds to manage these symptoms, uh, why there aren't or why there are. There are medications that can manage these symptoms, like the supplements. Um, you know, you've got the bladder, you've got the detrols, the ditropans, the oxybut oxybutynin, um, which can stop bladder spasms. But... <laughs> 
we're at we're at a very hard juncture in IC therapy right now because virtually every treatment for IC has been linked to some pretty serious stuff. Elmeron has been linked to eye disease, macular disease. And I know more and more doctors are finally getting on this bandwagon. They're understanding it because we now have multiple research studies. Our own resurvey shows a 53% rate of eye disease in pa of 1,000 patients. More than 1,000 patients have taken our El Elmeron survey. 53% of them report it. We know that Sister Protec has its own issue now with titanium dioxide. Ironically, titanium dioxide is also in Elmeron. Holy hell. Oh my God. You know, guys, I apologize. I'm swearing a lot these days. It's me. I'm not, I, I, I don't, I don't want to apologize. It's just me right now. It's just life right now. Don't take it the wrong way. It's just stress. And unfortunately now, as of two weeks ago, we know that the detrols, the ditropans, the elevils, the amitriptylines, the nortriptylines, the imipramines, are possibly linked with dementia. If you're over the age of 55 and taking one of these medications every day, they say if you do it every day for three years, it significantly increases your chance of dementia. So, you know, the question then becomes, what are the safer, what's, what are the safer approaches? And the safer approaches are going to be direct bladder installations. In fact, I sent a letter. You know what? I'll tell you what I did. I sent a letter to my medical board and to some other IC doctors that aren't on my board, but I talk to regularly. And it's like, all right, guys, I do not know how to talk about this. Please help me. You know, who are these are the top IC doctors in the world, right? And we get this new dementia study. And it's, I email them and I go, how do I talk about this? How do I talk about this to you? And one of them emailed me back and went, Jill, you're catastrophizing. You're catastrophizing. It's not as bad as you're making it. It's like, okay. Okay. And then Robert Evans emails me, responds, the top doctor in the country. He goes, you're absolutely right. And that's why we don't prescribe these hardly at all anymore in our clinic. Because we've long known there's an issue with these medications causing cognitive decline and dementia. And this is again why subtyping is so important. Because if your symptoms are driven by muscle tension, then you wouldn't be on Elmeron in the first place. And you wouldn't be on an antidepressant in the first place. You would be doing physical therapy and maybe even using a skeletal muscle relaxant, which is not linked to dementia. But if you're one of those people where you go to a doctor and you just say, give me a pill, I don't care what it is, you're defeating, you're, 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 you're just maximizing your risk. Because you got to get past the medication down to the cause of your pain. That is your first job, is to figure out what the hell is triggering this in the first place. That is why, again, at your appointments with your doctors, you're always talking about anatomy first. It's like, doctor, I have this pain here on the left side at this spot. Can you please help me understand what could be triggering that pain? And for all you know, that could either be a, a trigger point or it could be a hunter's lesion in that spot. We don't know. But the point is we got them looking at the damn spot. Whereas if you go in and say, I have IC, what are they going to do? They're just going to, they're going to give you the meds, the potentially risky meds. And, and so we got to, you have to be stronger and more assertive than ever now. And trying to, even if you're an old long-term appointment patient, man, you've had, you've had IC for 25 years and you say you've tried everything. Okay, then don't go to the doctor and ask about new treatment. Go to the doctor and say, okay, I want to understand why I have not responded to anything. Can you help me understand my body? I would like to know, number one, what's the condition of my pelvic floor? Number two, what's the, what's the 
quality and health of my skin. Number three, is there any chance I have untreated lesions? Let's get to the root of it so that you can do targeted therapy that reduces your risk overall. We're long past the day of patients just being given detrol and an, and an antihistamine and an antidepressant being sent on their way, even though that's what the guidelines say. You know, we got to, in my opinion, in my opinion, you got to look further than that. I hope that makes sense. Mary says, delivering the mail in this heat during, yeah, guys, oh my God, I totally forgot about the heat. Oh, I hope you're doing okay. Oh man, that is brutal. This is a the weirdest year. It's like every year gets weirder and weirder. So Ginny says, your doctor sent a specimen away for a week for analysis. When it came back positive, he sent it out again to see what it was. What, they didn't tell him what it was after a week? That's weird. Sharon says, Dr. Fezzi helped me like 30 years ago. Isolated bacteria, my primary care provider worked with me with antibiotics and I was helped. Agonizing pain for a long time, long-term antibiotics helped me. My bladder shows scarring and I'm paranoid about UTIs to this day. And you know, Sharon, that's one of the points that Dr. Malone Lee makes. It's like, what about those patients whose urine tests come back negative, but they're better um, they're, they're, they're better on antibiotics. Shouldn't, is it, is it right to take them in off of the antibiotics and put them in pain again? I mean, again, it's one of those really interesting debates that are happening. He says, no, he argues that a patient that is responding to antibiotics should be kept on antibiotics. And they're kind of pushing long-term antibiotics again, but it, you know, it's, there are pros and cons, risks and benefits. Jenny said, he, he sent it out to see what medication would work. So that we call that antibiotic sensitivity testing. Normally that's done in that week. Normally that's ordered when they order the urine test. So it's kind of odd that they did it again, but I think it's good that they did it again. Why not double check their work? So Jenny, I support that. Uh, Christine, what about the possibility that a human papillomavirus is causing IC? Um, that is a very strong possibility in some patients. It, um, I was working with a patient who had all the symptoms of IC. They later discovered she had urethral cancer from HPV. She had her urethra removed, her bladder removed, and a total hysterectomy at the age of 34. Um, uh, we know that patients flare their ice. Some patients ICs flare when they're if they have genital herpes if they have a herpes outbreak. So it is possible. And again, that's also something else the next generation DNA urine testing has the potential of doing, although it's a special order, and that is uh, doing uh, viral profiles. And there's somebody else now uh, doing um, a studies of the urinary virome. And let me look at it because I got an email from the researcher. Um, Let's see if I can find that. Who, where? It, I think it was a um, uh, research team in England that was doing that. Okay, so it, so they call it the virome, and so remember, we're trying to understand the the urinary biome, like what lives in the in the urinary system. And then in the biome, there are different groups. So you've got the virome, which is the viral population. You've got the fungalome, which is the fungal population. And then you've got the hostome. And I don't know what the hostome is. And so that, that's directly from that researcher who is at UCL in London, England. Sarah says she had a UTI, sepsis, kidney stone trauma, diagnosed with IC six months later. So, you know, so Sarah, um, 
you're, you're reminding me of Diane, who helped me start the IC network, who, who actually died of sepsis uh, at a very young age. Um, and so I'm really, really glad that you're, you made it. You made it over the crisis. I'm so happy for you that you did that. The challenge here is that kidney stones, you really need to know, are covered with bacteria. Uh, fairly new research. You know, we all kind of thought kidney stones were it was a mineral, right? Well, it turns out they're covered with bacteria. We had a patient, an, another interesting uh, patient, who was afraid to um, have anybody look in her bladder. She'd suffered for a couple of years, and it was getting progressively worse, progressively worse. She finally agreed to have a cystoscopy that looked inside her bladder, and what she had was a giant kidney stone. Uh, that was so big it wouldn't come through her urethra and it was floating in her bladder, cutting her bladder wall. And once they broke it, removed it, her symptoms went away and she healed. So um, you're in a very interesting group, Sarah, because we gotta, we gotta rule out the kidney stones. Remember too, you, you normally would identify the type of kidney stone that you would have. Normally it's a calcium oxalate kidney stone. They normally have you modify your diet appropriately. Kidney stones are kind of on the rise because oxalates come from almonds and uh, one of many sources of oxalates. And with so many people drinking almond milk, they're seeing more kidney stones because of almond milk consumption. So, um, uh, so question number one is, are there any kidney stones left? Uh, question number two is, did your bladder suffer damage from the kidney stone? You say trauma, that's absolutely possible. Question number three, was that original UTI uh, addressed properly? Be, I'd love to know how you're feeling now and are you better today or worse today? Christina, I have it totally, it's totally useless. All nerve medications fail. So, so um, why, I guess I kind of want to ask, why did you have it in the first place? I mean, you must have you must have had a trial and it succeeded. So then you had it put in. But but again, see, this is where subtyping is so important because neuromodulation interstim would not work for a hunter's lesion. It would not work for chemocystitis. It would not work. I mean, there's arguments pro and con for pelvic floor. You know, Tanya says, uh, she's talking about central sensitization. Do you have sensitive hearing too? God, oh my God, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And there is nothing worse for me than a crying animal. I can hear them all over the neighborhood. And it, I don't know, my brain just is so attuned to that. Leela says she's, she's sensitive. Sherry says she's almost out of bladder builder, so she's going to be ordering more. She doesn't know if it helps yet, but it gives her hope. Awesome. Hey, man, that's our goal here is to give you hope. Sophie says, is it bad to take hyphen tabs every day or twice a day? Uh, well, remember, I'm not a doctor. I can't give you medical advice. That's really a, a question for your doctor. Um, I have to refresh my memory on that. Oh, isn't that interesting? You're taking hyphen, hyphen HD, which is chlorpheniramine, hydrocodone, and phenylephrine. Girl, I got no experience with that. You got to talk with your doctor about that. Uh, I don't know. Emily, my bladder symptoms started after your first excision. Okay. So whenever you have a pelvic surgery, we know muscles are traumatized. We know nerves are traumatized as well as whatever's cut is traumatized in the organ. So you wouldn't be the first whose symptoms began after having some sort of procedure. Pauline, I have constant terrible irritation. I've tried just about everything to stop it. And I'm really acidic, even though I take basic tabs to reduce acidity. Pauline, how do you know that you're really acidic? Um, you have to remember, hun, you, you got to remember that many different things can irritate the bladder. But before we can even talk about what irritates the bladder, we have to talk about the quality and health of your skin. 
if your vulva's dry and your vagina's dry, so is your urethra and so is your bladder. And that would be that would explain why your urine is irritating your bladder so much. This is why as people get older, their diets tend to get a little bit more limited. You know, man, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you can get away with a lot of stuff. When you're in your 40s and 50s, not so much because your skin just doesn't have defenses for it. Your bladder doesn't have the same defenses. Uh, you're, you know, you're getting older. And so, Pauline, what I would, uh, I, to me, the most important thing here is to try to understand your anatomy and why are you so irritated? Are you taking a multivitamin every day? That could do it. Are you taking, are you drinking water out of a Brita water filter? Water filters produce acid water. Uh, their water filters are too good. They take out so many minerals. The water that comes out of a water filter is often acid, acidic. So if you're drinking that water all day, then that could explain why your bladder is a bit more irritating. Who is it? I was taught. And then there was somebody else, like somebody else in the last 10 days where we were having this conversation. And it was like, I kept coming back to the point. Her bladder was bright red. And it's like, okay, this really looks like daily irritation. And we were going over everything. Like, what are you eating? What are you drinking? And it went, it went right back to some sort of weird supplement she was taking that she thought was okay. Um, and I, we get this all the time. People are told to take certain vitamins for one condition. It's got a lot of vitamin C in it and bam, it kills the bladder, especially if you're menopausal. But Pauline, I got to tell you, you got to be careful with alkaline too. I, I don't support drinking alkaline water all day. I don't. Because, and as a chemist, you know, we were taught in school the dangers of acids like sulfuric acid and alkalines like bleach, like bleach. You wear goggles when you're working with both because you get bleach in your eyes, you get sulfuric acid in your eyes, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And if you've ever spilled bleach on your finger, it gets very slippery. That's the alkalinity dissolving your skin cells. So you could go too alkaline and actually irritate your bladder more. Your goal is to try to be pH neutral. We want to be pH neutral. You know, spring water, my friends, drink spring water. Um, filtered water, you know, you could also get pH test strips and test your water before it goes through your filter and after to see if that's part of the problem. Mm. This is what I'm drinking right now. I'm drinking a lot of LaCroix, just unflavored carbonated water. And I know La LaCroix has, has people who don't like it. I'm trying to lose my belly. All right, let's go down to YouTube here for a while. Hello, YouTube. It's nice to see you guys. Elise says, I have a heart condition that I have to take a lot of medication for. I find that the blood that blood thinners trigger your IC symptoms a lot, but I don't dare stop taking it either. No, hon, you can't. You can't. But you do need to tell your doctor that and say, are there any other options? Barbara, does Piora only help with pain or does it help with frequency? Um, uh, the study in Italy, which I which I outlined in here, let's just, let me go right back to it. In Italy, researchers did a study with 23 IC patients who had not responded well to, tra to traditional prescription medications for treating their IC symptoms. Each patient began taking 100 milligrams of PEA a day, the patients, who had an, the patients who had an initial exam, history and evaluation, were followed up at three months and six months after taking P. By six months, 75% of patients had a significant de decrease in their pain and 25% had no pain. The researchers said no side effects were reported. So they didn't talk about frequency urgency in the poster session that we saw at AUA. So I don't know. Worth a shot. All right, you too. Let me just move this up here for a moment. 
Lorraine says, what do you think about taking cyclosporin uh, for, I, for IC? Hey, hey man, I, I got to tell you, cyclosporin, it, we're just getting more and more and more and more good reports from this. Cyclosporin is very um, robust at working with patients with profound inflammation. Um, and it's coming at, you know, when it first came out, it was kind of scary for everyone because there's a lot of side effects so associated with cyclosporin, really weren't sure who to go to, what doctors who would do it. Um, but now cyclosporin has been in use for uh, five years or longer, and there are numerous success stories. I was working with a husband and wife, older man, I think he was like 75, 80 years old, or maybe, maybe not 80, but probably in his 70s. And nothing had worked for him. And his doctor finally put him on cyclosporin. And, and he, for the first time, he was actually doing profoundly better. Um, the challenge, again, with cyclosporin is the side effects. The most worrisome side effect really tends to be changes in your blood pressure. So you got cyclosporin has to be monitored carefully. It lowers your immune system. So you got to be careful about not being exposed to other people who are sick. It is a step five treatment in the AUA treatment protocol. Annie says she just started installations for bladder cocktails this week. Feeling a little relief. Awesome. Love to know what installation you're doing. Hey, Barbara from Australia. How's your winter going? Is it super cold? Barbara says, is Laura Tadine okay to take? Well, that's the perfect question for your doctor and your pharmacist. I would Google it, which is what I'm doing right now. Well, it's Claritin. Uh, so hold on. So Laura Tadine, hold on. I think I know what you're talking about. I have an article on this here. I've got an article. We also have an article in our magazine on the anticholinergic medications. So let us see if loratadine is on there. Um, they have, okay, so it's loratadine is not in the, the big list of of drugs that are the most risky. However, it is, uh, they say it's an anticholinergic drug to watch out for, but it has fewer effects on the brain. So according to that research, it would be safer than say amitriptyline every day. Hillary says, you had IC for three years just last week, was diagno diagnosed with urea plasma. Sure. Is she asking you have it for a long time? Yeah, you can. Uh, Barbara says, is water from a distiller also acidic? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, you're basically, through the distillation process, it's leaving, it, you're, you know, when you distill something, so you're basically boiling it, and the vapors are then trapped in a tube and the tube then kind of bends and sometimes it curls and it cools off and whatever's in that vapor becomes a liquid again and drips out the other end. And so I, I honestly don't know what that does to the acidity. She says it's very cold in Wollongong. Sophie says she's going through a flare right now. Girl, I'm sorry to hear that. Jill says, thanks for talking about all this info. Happy to do it. And remember, guys, I mean, the IC network. Hold on. Right there. That's our website, icnetwork.org. Come over to our website. You know, it's so interesting. Websites are the dinosaurs now of the internet. It's crazy. You know, 20 years ago, we were all reading websites. Now, most people don't go to websites. Y'all come to social networking. 
But the good information rated number one in the world by Harvard Medical School and the University of London is over on our website, icnetwork.org. I curate that information every day. It's a beast of a job, let me tell you. Amy says, my sex life is non-existent because of severe, severe fatigue and inflammation, flu feeling all flu feeling all the freaking time. Nothing helps besides being knocked out. But the Valium suppository works. Okay, so Amy, let's focus on the let's, I need you to focus on the concept of cause and effect. If a Valium suppository is working for you, then what that tells us is that your pelvic floor muscles are toast. There's something dysfunctional and tight about your pelvic floor. So I'm really, really glad that that's working for you. But we got to try to figure out the fatigue and inflammation. You know, guys, it's perfectly reasonable to ask for some blood testing you know, get your hormone levels, get your vitamin levels. You wouldn't believe the number of people who are deficient in vitamin B12 and vitamin D. And that could potentially explain fatigue. Also, it would be perfectly reasonable to have a thyroid test. Maybe your thyroid's dysfunctional right now. I mean, I was diagnosed with low thyroid in my early 20s. And hypothyroidism is a related condition to IC. We don't really know why, but it's common. So I think it, it would be reasonable to ask for some more blood tests here and see if they can find that. Aaron said, vaginal Valium caused you to have a yeast infection. Aaron, only if it had sugar in it. If the vaginal Valium suppository had a carb in it that was, fe that was feeding fungus, then yes, it could have exacerbated a pre-existing yeast infection. But the odds are that it, 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 it may have been an accident of timing, hun. You may have had yeast on your skin as you push the Valium suppository in, bam, there you go. I don't know if vaginal Valium can change the pH in your vagina that could make you more vulnerable though. Good question for your doctor. Doris, I've had IC for 20 years, never found relief until six months ago. I started taking a Nablex. It's an overactive bladder pill. I've tried so many. I was surprised this pill works. This helps, it helps with urgency. And that was always my worst symptom. So Doris, again, in your case, getting back to your subtype, I think, is an in, will be a very interesting journey for you. Um, because we don't know what is driving that. Is it a dysfunction of your bladder? Is it hormones? Is it tight muscles? And I still think you've got to get down to some fundamental anatomy discussions. Justin, Justin Danielle says BNO suppositories are the only things that help you. So that's a big time belladonna opiate suppository. That's for big time pain, pain control. And I'm so, so sorry that you're in pain and that you need to use them. It would be, it might be very interesting for you to try the Piora and see if the Piora might reduce your pain to the point that you won't need to use those as frequently. Sophie says, first time you went to the doctor five years ago, you told her all of your symptoms. She did an ultrasound and showed me, showed me your bladder and it looked like someone had took a knife to it had red, red cuts or lines all the way around it. And she diagnosed me as having IC. So she, what she basically diagnosed you with is having traumatic injury to the bladder, right? And AKA IC, subtype two, bladder wall driven. Uh-oh, looks like we lost Facebook. Aw, Facebook, Facebook, no. And there's so many good questions to answer. No, no, no. 
Can you guys still hear me on Facebook? Because I've got a warning. I mean, I, I'm seeing all your symbols, but I'm getting a connectivity error. Hey, if you could, uh, for those of you on Facebook, could you please um, write down if you're still, still seeing the stream or if you've disconnected? God, look at these great questions. Leela says, I found that going off Nexium, Gaviscon, anti-GERD meds really help your IC pain calm down. Awesome. Does that make sense? Because medications can irritate the bladder. Some medications are well known to do that. Barbara down in Australia says the feed is just fine, loud and clear. Sherry says, your, your, your grand boys are listening. Hello, grand boys from California. It's nice to see you. Thanks for watching, dudes. I appreciate that. Jill says, didn't have this pain until our third lithotripsy, one on each 13 years when you left February. Could this be caused by the passing of the gravel? Yeah, it could be. And or maybe you were injured during the lithotripsy in some way. Tanya says, oh my God, I drink almond milk, use almond flour and have one tiny kidney stone in your right kidney. Tanya, there you go, girl. Sean says, my nerve pain seems to be ratcheting up with electric shocks to my legs and arms. They always seem when I'm flaring. So um, Sean, that really, you've got to be working with a neurologist. They got to work at, they got to look at your spinal cord, hon. I really have to wonder if you've got a compressed disc or something else going on. You shouldn't be having electric shocks in your legs or arms. Christina says, what about drinking baking soda and water? And the answer is, if you can do it, uh, only once a day, quarter teaspoon of baking soda and a glass of water. Don't do it all day, every day, because the sodium, it'll raise your blood pressure. Linda asks, is Fiji water okay? The answer is yes. Christine says, what kind of spring water do, do I drink? It's Arrow, Arrowhead or Crystal Geyser. Jenny says, my husband husband's urine came back with bacteria and he, and he was prescribed Augmentin. Our follow-up is Tuesday. Anything we should ask? Um, uh, additional testing. Let's just make sure it's gone. And uh, probiotics, let's make sure that Augmentin's a tough, uh, strong antibiotic. It can really kill a lot of stuff down there. And um, uh, so we want to make sure that you've got good beneficial bacteria in there. Barbara on YouTube says, I have electric shocks and need to have a disc replacement at L5. So to whoever was having electric shocks, got to look at that spinal cord. Lucy says, can naproxen and cyclobenzaprine make your flare worse? Not, well, cyclobenzaprine is a muscle relaxant, not usually. I don't know about naproxen. Leela's asking about stem cells in IC. That's Dr. Elliot Lander. The research shows that stem cell therapy, while initially effective, is not durable, and patients have to have, have it redone at about six months. And unfortunately, when you have it redone at six months, uh, if they harvest enough stem cells the first time, you're good. If they don't, you it can be very, very expensive to have it done over and over again. Irene is asking about Plavix. She said she recently had a stroke. Is Plavix safe for your bladder? I don't know, hun. Uh, it's for your, you gotta talk to your pharmacist and your doctor about that. That is so weird. You, it says you guys are still here, but like my screen is faded out and it says trying to reconnect. So you know what? I'm just gonna ignore it and keep answering your questions. I think it's because I, I don't wanna disconnect this feed. Now, Facebook, given the fact that it's starting to fail, if I disappear suddenly, just know I'll reboot it because I, I'm planning on being here 
was planning on doing a long stream tonight. I really wanted to kick it and do a really good support group meeting tonight. I'm afraid that if I touch it, I'm going to break it. Good, 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 good. Rhea, Rhea, the questions go by so quickly and Facebook won't let me scroll back. So if you asked a question and I didn't answer it, please don't take that personally. Just ask it again. That's one of the flaws with Facebook, okay? Sue, got four pack, got a four pack of breezy, super light fabric shaping underwear. After a half an hour out in the heat with my sundress on, it felt like you were on fire down there. Uh, she must be something on them when they come from the manufacturer. Wash, wash, wash the blank out before you try them again. Hey, you know, you guys, I mean, seriously, seriously, anytime you buy any clothing, any clothing, you always, always wash it before you wear it. Uh, I did a big article on that uh, some uh, got some time ago um, where, you know, there it's well known that there's a group of people who put on brand new jeans. They don't wash the jeans first and they break out in a terrible rash on their legs. My mom put on a new shirt from China. Uh, they tend to be blue and her back has never been the same. She broke out in this big bumpy rash and eight years later, she still has, I mean, it's not as bad as it was, but it's still there. You, you can't trust. Uh, I would never put on something that I came from China without washing it several times. India, a little bit better. I, I, some of their cotton stuff. I don't, obviously, as you can tell, I only wear cotton anyway. Aaron's trying to figure out, hun, I'm just scrolling down. Would Laura, would Pure help with pelvic floor pain? Yeah, it would help with any pain. Sean says, neurologist says the nerves are being pinched but can't find the reason. All right, so so then you need a new neurologist <laughs> and you need to have really extensive testing. I was, you know what? I was working with a patient yesterday who had, what did she have? It was down at L4, L5. She had a, she, and she was an athlete like me. Um, and she had surgery 17 months ago. And she, and it was about a ruptured disc by L4, L5. And she said the pain before the surgery was insane. So Sean, that's not your bladder, hun. That's something in your spinal cord. That's a, that's something bony compromising a nerve. You know, Guys, you got to understand that there are three different levels of doctors. You've got local physicians who handle the easy stuff. You know, the sprained ankle, the occasional UTI, the occasional little kidney stone, a uh, pap test, a uh, flu, cold. But they don't go to the conferences. Okay, they're not specialists. They're not as as good of a specialist as others who regularly attend conferences and classes and teach classes. So when a local doctor is out is 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 flummoxed, they don't know what to do next for you. They're going to send you to a regional doctor. That is usually somebody like for me. I'm in. I'm about 80 miles north of San Francisco. Our regional doctors are in San Francisco, and I was sent to San Francisco for my IC within a year because my local doctor really didn't know what to do next. And the regional doctors have much more experience with a larger population of challenging patients, but. Some of you will be so complex that you out you outclass the regional doctors, and you've got to go to a national specialist. You've got to go to somebody with a national reputation who does the research, who is a, 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 um, incredible surgeons. And so, Laura, uh, actually, Sean. Um, if your local neurologist can't figure out what's being pinched, man, you got to up your game. You're going to need to ask for a referral and a second opinion, in my opinion. 
Jenny said, Jenny, I missed that. I'm scrolling back here. I'm trying to find, uh, see, sometimes it lets me scroll and sometimes it doesn't. Jenny is asking, yes, he's been sick. Does that mean I, it's I see? I can't see the I can't see what you said before that, hun. So if you could say that again, that would be great. Hi, Lisa. Somebody's asking about Cipro and fluoroquinolones. And guys, you have to understand that fluoroquinolone medications are no longer risk suggested are recommended for typical urinary tract issues because they are linked to such severe side effects and adverse events and fatalities. So Cipro is no longer a go-to for urine infections. And the only time they should be used is if that patient has no other options. We did a big alert about that earlier this year. That's an FDA warning. There is a small group of patients who take Cipro, healthy patients, take a small prescription of Cipro, and it's like it destroys their immune system. And they, are, they end up with this weird syndrome that um, is profoundly uh, damaged. Um, I don't know. It's, it's in one of our magazines. I don't remember which one. It, it Maybe. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So this was our winter IC optimist, the dangers of Cipro and Leviquin. Have you been floxed? And that's what they call it. They call it floxed. That if you have suffered a severe side effect to Cipro, they, um, and let's see. So Prescribed more than 32 million times in the U.S. in 2015, fluoroquinolones have caused devastating side effects for tens of thousands of patients, including diarrhea, vomiting, tendon rupture, joint, muscle, and nerve conditions, retinal detachment, aortic aneurysm, central nervous system dysfunction, insomnia, restlessness, fatigue, seizures, convulsions, psychosis, and more. Some patients have developed hemolytic uremic sy syndrome, a condition that affects the blood and blood vessels resulting in the destruction of blood platelets, anemia, and kidney failure. Um, and then a very small group of patients, most often healthy young females, have developed fluoroquinolone disability syndrome, where they become permanently dis disabled after using the medication for minor medical conditions. So if you want to learn more about that, if you're a member, just you can just go download our last issue from your member page. Or, you know, you can be, if you, if you become a member today, you can, any membership level, you will be able to download this right out of your membership page very, very quickly, like literally within a minute. Erin, I had an IUD for eight years. You also have IBS, lazy colon. I didn't have a period during this time. Would that have changed my estrogen levels? I think it could, but I don't think we have proof of that, Erin. Tanya says, I have to take potassium fluoride daily due to hypokalemia. Does this supplement affect the IC bladder wall? Potentially, yes. Potassium taken in quantity can be irritating. But early on, potassium was absolutely demonized. Foods containing potassium were abs absolutely demonized. But then we had uh, some really good diet research, which showed that some foods that were high in potassium were actually soothing to the bladder, like bananas. And those research re researchers kind of remarked that you would never get through food the, 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 the toxic and irritating level of potassium that you would get, such as in a potassium sensitivity test. But you definitely need to tell your doctor that you're struggling with the potassium irritation. And maybe something like a bladder coating you know, like bladder rest uh, might be helpful for you or Desert Harvest Aloe or Sister Renew. If you haven't seen, this is bladder rest. This is our replacement for Sister Protect. 
now that Sister Protec has died an unseemly death as a product. And we've got Bladder Builder. But this is a very robust formula. It's got, in addition to the chondroitin and the glucosamine and the quercetin, it's got collagen in it, it's got vitamins in it, it's got probiotics in it, and it has PEA in it. And if you hadn't seen this, Let's see where is it? Do I bring a bottle of this time? See, I got a, a big bottle, a big bag of stuff here. I'm we're I'm 20 miles away from our our warehouse, so I don't get to see all the new stuff. But here's a here's another reveal, guys. And that is the new labeling for Desert Harvest Aloe. So if you're confused by the old label, which is, this is the old label, and this is the new label. So don't be confused if you're, if you're looking for this, but you see this. It was about time the company rebranded because this has been um, a very difficult design to work with. Hello, Becky. I'm so glad you made it, hon. Sorry you had to work late today. And if you hear this noise here, guys, I'm sorry. That's something That's something on my floor here. Lisa, only three practices in Houston do urgent PC. My frequency is getting really bad. Any suggestions on how to convince my Eurogyn to let me try PTN, PTNS? Well, why? It, uh, number one, it's more affordable than uh, InterStem. Number two, it has far fewer side effects than InterStem. And number three, it's rated equivalent in success to InterStem. And number four, it's a it's a, approved by Medicare. So I don't understand why they would hesitate. It's cheaper. It's less risky. The only reason they might hesitate is because these those are those doctors who try to make more money, and they make more money doing surgery. So some doctors don't want to do urgent PC in their clinic because it's not as profitable as them doing surgery with InterStem. April uses ice packs for relief. Does this help anyone else? Yes. Some people love heat and some people love ice. And in case you haven't seen this, This is a really cool mama strut. It's the shape of a menstrual pad and it's a gel pad that you can either freeze or heat up. And so if you are having clitoral irritation and you need ice down there, put this in your fridge, let it cool up. Obviously you're then gonna wrap it in a towel and then you can slide it right where you need it the most. So these are called mama strut. They're very popular. You know, the heat packs tend to work really well for muscle tension. The ice packs tend to work well for nerve pain. Deborah says, bladder builder or bladder rest? How do you know which one to use? Um, you know, honestly, it's about your level of sensitivity, hon. If you're like me, somebody who's super, super sensitive to stuff and you're kind of afraid to try new things and you want it as simple as it could possibly be, then, then you want to start with bladder rest because there are fewer ingredients in this, in this. But if you aren't worried about taking things, your body responds well to supplements, yada, 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 then you can go ahead and start with the bladder builder and, and get you know the benefit of that really big formula. But there's 28 ingredients in this. Um, I don't have any reported side effects for bladder rest of anybody who's called me personally to say they're having issues. Um, with Bladder Builder, I've had four people call, and pretty much all of them said that it, it now realize there's like 700 people using it. So I've had four people call to say that it gave them the runs. And my, sus my suspicion is that it might be the probiotics in this for some people. Some people are more sensitive to probiotics. So any doubt, start with the simpler one first, which would be bladder rest. Leela says she misses Go Commandos pads. Yeah, I haven't seen. Yeah, you're right. Go Commandos were really cool. Um, um, I don't know. They were pads, but they were you. They were you. They were a very small, very innovative design. You could wear them with thongs. 
for people who like to wear thongs. I don't like to wear thongs. I'm not going to wear one. I have a rule here, guys. You know what my rule is here? If you're dating somebody and he goes, hey, would you wear a thong? My answer is only if you'll wear one. <laughs> Okay, Mary Jo says. Of course, that that follows up on another 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 really important rule in our family that that has been passed along to everybody who's gotten married in our family and that is you're going to argue with your partner, but the rule is do it naked. <laughs> because when you do it naked, very quickly you 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 kind of see the forest for the trees. Uh, somebody's come on on YouTube. Hey, um, so dude here on YouTube, we're actually doing a support group meeting. We've got people in here in severe pain. Uh, and this is a serious meeting and I, I need you to respect that. Um, these are people who may have had um, traumatic injuries uh, to their pelvis. I've got people who uh, cannot sit in cars. They cannot work. They cannot eat. Um, and the purpose of this meeting is to give them some hope. So thank you for retracting that message. I really appreciate that. Mary Jo says, for the last few years, I got bad IC pain about a week before my period. And then for a few days after the mild pain for the two weeks in between, two years to figure out it was related to your cycle. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Azo is the only way for me to get relief. I'm hoping when I'm done with my period that this stops. Any other women out there has gone through that. So, so Mary Jo, you know, when we talk about those subtypes and we talk about IC subtype two bladder wall driven, I didn't mention this, but I, I absolutely believe there is a sub subtype in there that is entirely hormonal. It's never been defined properly, but, but I have worked with patients like you for years who show very clear hormone inf hormonal influences, even at very, very young ages. And as they've gone through the years trying to fix their hormones and trying to get things stabilized, when they finally get stabilized, their symptoms go away and they're stunned. And for some people it's about high estrogen levels and for others it's about low estrogen levels. It's very weird. And, and so that is the great unknown territory here are, are, the, are people like you who struggle with the hormone influence. Make sure you emphasize that with your doctor. Talk with your gynecologist about it. Ask for hormone testing. As an example, I had a patient uh, who's, who reached out by email this week whose estrogen levels were astronomical, like massively high, like 10 times of normal. And her progesterone level was incredibly low. And she was asking, what would that do to my bladder? And, and what, you know, my answer back was, we don't really know what it would do to your bladder, but what it would certainly do is promote the growth of endometrial tissue. And I suggested that she, before she do any additional test, any, any hormone therapy, ask her doctor to measure her endometrium to see if there's normal growth in there or not. Because if there's, it could be massively out of control and could lead to a really big issue with that. Jenny says, bacteria in his urine showed up after they milked his prostate. He's on augment. Does that mean it's IC? Um, Jenny, not necessarily. You know, so chronic prostatitis, there are four classifications for chronic prostatitis. Uh, the first two relate to identifiable infections. I forget what the third one is. The fourth one is in the absence of infection. And so given the fact that they've actually identified a bacteria that would, based upon the current guidelines, you would be excluded from a diagnosis of IC and he would be instead diagnosed with chronic prostatitis bacterial. Um, the challenge with the prostate, just so you know, is, is it has very small drainage ducts. And so it's very common for people, for men to get a deep infection in their prostate and for the prostate to kind of become stagnant uh, because it's not draining properly because those little tiny tubes are blocked. And so what they do is they go in usually through the rectum with a finger and they milk the prostate. They rub against the prostate, try to get some fluid out. They express that fluid and culture that fluid and that's how they identify those infections. But I'm glad you found a doctor through our page, that's awesome. 
Shotzi said uh, fluoroquinolone levaquin left her with tendon issues in her foot. That's a well-known risk. Beatrix says anti-bladder spasm meds seem to make your symptoms worse. That's, you know, got to understand that anti-spasmodics, so you've got two different types of muscles in your, in your pelvis. You've got the smooth muscle of your bladder and the striated muscle, skeletal muscle of your pelvic floor. They, you both can spasm, but they use completely different medications. So if you're having real bladder spasms, they're going to do a smooth muscle relaxant like ditropan or detrol. If you're having skeletal muscle pelvic floor spasms, they're going to be using flexoril or baclofen. If you take a smooth muscle relaxant every day, what happens, because this happened to me, I took a I took a ditropan for about three months, is that it slowly kind of deadens the muscle and deadens your ability to pee. So it gets harder and harder and harder to pee because that muscle is being so heavily influenced by the medicine. And so in general, antispasmodics are taken when you're having spasms, not necessarily every day. And of course, now we know that there's a risk for a, a strong risk of dementia for patient, patients over the age of 55 who take it every day for three years, detrol ditropan can increase your risk of dementia and cognitive decline. So that kind of points back to talking with your doctor and asking when you should be using it. Beatrix, what is the best supplement for when pain is extremely severe? Girl, it, it depends upon the type of pain you're having, hon. If you're having pelvic floor pain, no, you know, you got to do pelvic floor relaxation stuff to break it out of pain. And so we wouldn't, a supplement wouldn't be the first choice. The first choice would be uh, taking a hot bath, a hot shower, using a heating pad, using a muscle relaxant, using a vaginal valley suppository. If you're having bladder wall pain, um, then you know you could try the uh, azos, but azos usually don't touch you know the the pyridium that turns your urine orange. Yeah, it never did anything for me when my bladder was pain was really bad. It never touched it. Um, that I guess that's when you would, if you want to stay with the supplements, you could go for the aloe or go for the piora or even do both because the aloe would coat, coat and soothe your bladder and the piora would actually reduce the pain sensation potentially according to the research. Tanya, is bladder breast the mildest supplement since you have sensitivities and you have shellfish allergy? And in terms of a supplement that contains a coating effect, yes, uh, because there's no shellfish or fish in bladder rest. So that would be viable, or you could try the Piora, but the Piora is not going to have an effect on your bladder. It's just going to potentially be pain fighting. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Jamie. Uh, Karen says, what's the best? You know, I was thinking as I was driving to the den or away from the dentist this morning, I was like going, all right, I need to do a blog. I need to take down my old blogs about supplements and do new blogs about these supplements because Karen says, what's the best supplement to take? And, you know, again, guys, it's all, it's always going to be trial and error. It's always going to be trial and error. I mean, there's no way I can tell you which one's going to work for you. It's really a process of experimenting. Um, if you're sensitive you want to start simply. And so, you know, kind of one of the first things I ask people is, do you have an aloe intolerance? Some people do. Well, quite a few people are, are sensitive to aloe. So if you're sensitive to aloe, that rules out desert harvest aloe and that rules out um, cistarino. Uh, if you're sensitive to probiotics, that's going to rule out bladder builder. Bladder rest really is the kind of the perfect compromise, but there's really no way that I can, anybody can say it's going to work for you. You just have to try it, hon. Uh, and it's worth trying. I mean, seriously, these are worth trying. 
Jeannie says her nephew was left with nerve damage in his hands from Cipro. So Jenny, you know, um, it would be very interesting for him to Google PEA and nerve damage. I don't, I, I honestly don't, uh, I don't know if PEA is appropriate for nerve damage, but it's certainly uh, a viable option if it is. Beatrix says, what is my regimen? Uh, what is my regimen? Hmm, isn't that a good question? I don't take anything every day because uh, my bladder's good um, right now. Um, my regimen is thyroid medicine, B12, D, coconut oil, uh, topically, every day, several times a day, speaking as a dry menopausal woman, if you know what I mean. Um, when I, um, I don't, I, I, I've had one soda in a decade, and it was a little thing of 7-Up because it was really, really na nauseated. I don't drink soda. I don't drink anything like that at all. I do sparkling waters um, and stuff. Um, because, and because my bladder has healed, I can get away with a few more things now, but I'm still I'm still pretty protective. Um, what got me here, I realized my first year with IC was agony. Every single night, I was bawling my eyes out. I would go in our living room, lay on the floor and pray to God while I cried. And I never flushed the toilet all night long because I was peeing every 10 minutes because I didn't want my family, I didn't want to wake up my family. It's like, all right, I can flush it at the end of the day. Cause you know, at that point you're just peeing drops. Um, what helped back then was number one diet. No, I didn't know about the diet for a year. Um, we didn't have Elmer on back then. They tried some anti antidepressants. They made my heart race, couldn't do the antidepressants. Um, and I got referred to UC San Francisco and did urgent PC, the post nerve stimulation. And that's what broke me out of that year long flare. Um, and then after that, um, I did the antihistamines. I did hydroxyzine for, for several, several years. Um, and slowly but surely things calmed down and tissue began healing. Um, I had a hydrodistension two years ago. My bladder's completely healed completely healed. My pelvic floor is toast. My pelvic floor is a, okay, I almost did it. I almost did it. Here, I got to, speaking of pelvic floor, I got to stand up. I think my biggest barrier right now is just working and sitting. Hold on. There you go. So I am, whoops, 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 hold on. What I do? All right, here we go. Um, hold on. This is what I do all day. I go from standing to sitting to standing to sitting because my pelvic floor, my left piriformis, I have piriformis syndrome on my left side is my dominant problem right now. And so it's working with physical therapists, muscle relaxants, that's what I turn to the most. I don't use bladder medications hardly at all. Ooh, it's getting warm. I'm kind of sweating. Tanya, let's see, hold on. So I kind of screwed this up here. Um, getting back to the best supplement, if, we, if you're just going for straight pain control, then it would be Peora. And that's what you want to try is Peora. Which one is better long-term, bladder rest or bladder builder? I'm crippled by the pain. If you're crippled by the pain, I would be doing bladder builder for sure. 
because at least you have an ability of fighting some of that pain, hun. Edith says, I was hospitalized in January with sepsis, a result of UTI. I have not been the same since. I wonder if the IV antibiotics uh, was Cipro. Hmm. I'd be very interested to get your medical record, hun. I mean, you can ask for it. I mean, girl, you were fighting for your life. They were fighting for your life. So they had to treat it aggressively. And it takes a lot of time for the human body to recover and find that normal level of balance. You got to remember, Edith, that the human body has, I, well, I think, like a trillion bacteria living in it, helping us digest food and helping all sorts of things in our body. The human body is not sterile. We rely on bacteria to perform essential functions. And when, and unfortunately in your case, you got, a, you got a very bad pathogenic infection. It spread to your bloodstream and it started causing chaos throughout your whole body. So of course they're gonna hit that big time with antibiotics, big time. Of course, the reality of that now is that restoring your biome is going to take time. So it doesn't surprise me that you're not, you don't feel the same, but I have hope that you will feel the same. Um, but, you know, it's going to take a little bit of research on your part to really try to understand a little bit more about what they did and all that sort of stuff. Sorry, guys, the sun is starting to set. Oh, you know what? Maybe. See, this is what happens. See, this is what I do all day. Up and down, up and down, up and down. But that's what you do when you've got PNE, guys, and you got a muscle issue. You're foolish if you stay in a position that hurts. You got to get up and move. Here, and I'm going to move my. This is the other cool thing I have. Let me show it to you. It's called fluid stance. So you stand on it when you're at your stand desk. And I, I love it. Okay, I'm gonna stand on it. Okay, and so what's cool about it is that, I'm sorry, just trying to get things. Hold on, what? What is going, what is the problem here? Is that the problem? Oh, that's the problem right there. Okay. Well, if I do that anymore, whoops, whoops, hold on. <laughs> All right. Well, that's just going to be the best it's going to be. Sorry. It is what it is, my friends. It is what it is. This is not working. Okay. Hold on. Flexibility. We're just gonna have to go down. We're going down. So instead, one sec. All right, I will sit on my yoga ball. Okay. <laughs> All right. Alrighty then, so we've hit the two hour mark. I'm going to keep going as long as you want to keep going. Hey, you know what the best part about doing a life support group meeting is? You can get up and use the bathroom anytime you need to and nobody will know. So do it. If you need to go, go. Don't let me stop you. Danny Daisy, you're at your public hospital right now. Just had your second heparin. 
Heparin hydrocortisone installation after your diagnosis a month ago, you're feeling overwhelmed, Terry, sat down in the cafeteria to eat lunch, and you saw this feed pop up. Yeah, baby. I'm so glad that you found us because hopefully you now see that you are not alone. You're not alone at all. We're here. You've got tons of IC brothers and sisters. Trying to do it alone is such a big mistake. You know, there are people out there with hard earned wisdom. Good example is marshmallow root. A lot of people online say do marshmallow root. I can tell you for a fact that 50% of people who try marshmallow root flare from it. And so, you know, this is, this is new for you. I'm sure you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I want you to come on over to our website. I want you to watch our videos, Living with IC, our Living with IC video series. Um, we have a really good video called The Five Subtypes of IC. It's really, really important that you watch that video because we want to try to find your unique variation of IC so that we can find the right treatments for your unique variation. Okay, because a one treatment fits all approach does not work. So now what we're trying to do is create customized treatment plans based upon a patient's individual presentation. Some people can have bladder wall damage. Others can have muscle damage. Others can have nerve damage. Others can have symptoms from fibroid tumors or endometriosis or tarlof cysts. There are lots of different things that potentially can contribute IC. What I can tell you is we no longer think of IC as an incurable bladder disease. We think of it more as an injury or trauma to the pelvis, not just to the bladder, but often to the muscles and to the nerves. If you ever want to talk, we have a support uh, phone line. You're always welcome to give the support phone line and we're happy to take a few questions from you. Okay. Uh, Sean is, at, is telling people about intrarosa. Intrarosa is a, uh, a new estrogen therapy. It's a precursor to estrogen, if I remember correctly, um, that has actually helped quite a few people. I'm getting a lot of good stories about intrarosa. Uh, ironically, my own doctor won't even talk to me about it. I have a consult with the pelvic doctor in San Francisco on July 31st. Leela says, muscle relaxing given to me by your doctor for terrible IC pain caused you not to be able to pee. You had to cath yourself. Learning that lesson the hard way. So it sounds like the muscle relaxant was just too strong, hun. Sounds like it was way, 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 way too strong. Half doses, quarter doses. You got to make sure you talk with your doctor about that. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe he made a mistake in how much you did. Um, but I, I would certainly want more information as to why that might have happened. I have no idea why that could have happened for you. I have never had issues, uh, but when I take a muscle relaxant, I take Flexeril and I take a quarter of a pill, a quarter of the lowest dose. I've never had any problems like that. So I don't know. Hi, Robin. Beatrix says, that's exactly what I'm going through. I only drink water. I was told that I will need Elmeron. So um, uh, Beatrix, um, um, Elmeron is now associated with some uh, retinal damage. And so uh, for long-term use, like more than a few, uh, I, I, I mean, the research is still very new, but it certainly created some pause in prescriptions for Elmeron. Many, if not most patients are choosing not to start with Elmeron first. Instead, they're starting with a supplement that has a, a similar bladder coating effect, but without the risk. And so that would really be uh, bladder rest, bladder builder, whoops, desert harvest aloe would be one, Cisto Renew would be the other. We're no longer recommending Sister Protec. Or not recommending, suggesting Sister Protec. Wow, look at that glow. What is that? Oh, it's a car. All right. Yeah. 
Sherry, what's the difference between sparkling water and carbonated soda like Ancola, Sprite, or 7-Up? Well, number one, sparkling water doesn't have any flavorings in it, doesn't have sugar in it, it doesn't have caffeine in it, uh, it doesn't have the extra, a lot of the extra added colorings and all that sort of stuff, etc. So sparkling water is kind of the, the, if you're somebody who you just really need something like that to uh, kind of give you that satisfaction, then, then try sparkling water. But I wouldn't do an Uncola or a Sprite or 7-Up. Those are going to hurt like hell. Um, I personally find that carbonated soda is a little bit rougher than sparkling water. Tanya says, any specific coconut oil? Yeah, you want to look for a cold-pressed organic virgin coconut oil. And it's going, hmm, yours is organic but really smells sweet like coconut. It irritates you. Hold on. Let me go get mine. Hold on. And you guys, I need to take a moment and thank. Oh, there we go. We always, always, always have to take a moment and thank our sponsor. Okay, now remember, I'm sitting on a ball. I'm going to bounce up and down. I'm sorry. Okay, Preleaf. Preleaf. This supplement has been around for 25 years. It has been used by tens of thousands of patients very, very successfully to reduce acid in foods you might be eating. So if you got to go to grandma's house and eat her spaghetti, even though you know it might kill your bladder because of the tomato sauce, you can take a pre-leaf or two beforehand and that might help. Uh, this works with tomato sauce. It works with alcohol, all sorts of things. Um, and so we want to do a big shout out to pre-leaf for underwriting these live support group meetings and um, uh, are incredibly grateful for their support of the IC movement. Um, as I was saying earlier on Twitter, I said, um, there's really very few companies now supporting IC patients in the IC community and patient education, but DSC Healthcare Solutions is one of them. And we are very, 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 very grateful for their sponsorship. All right, so here is my coconut oil and it is emerald added a free doctor formulated pure extra virgin coconut oil, non hydrogenated, cold pressed, and it is hot today. God, I love the smell of it. I don't know why you're I mean, did you Tanya, you might have bought a coconut oil that was more meant to be used as food rather than use I mean there this is kind of that gray area where there's some coconut oil meant for food processing like I just bought coconut oil margarine for baking for a pie for a made a peach pie uh I wouldn't put that on my vulva um so I'm not sure hun but I have to tell you, I could like, I could like roll in this every day and be really happy because I love coconut. Also, um, my dental hy hygienist said today that she, she actually uses it all over her neck and all over her face. Man, the more moisture, the better. This whole getting old thing sucks. This whole Having no estrogen because of hysterectomy sucks even more. Uh, Sean says, watch out for hydroxyzine. It can take, it cause nightmares. Absolutely. Hydroxyzine is an antihistamine. It's well known for reducing inflammation in the, or mast cell induced irritation in the bladder wall. But the, the biggest challenge with hydroxyzine can be heat intolerance and it intensifies your dreams. So if you're having a good dream, like a, a good sex dream, and believe me, it's going to be the best sex of your life dream with your favorite Hollywood actor or actress, whatever. 
But if you have a nightmare, it becomes a night terror. So when I was taking hydroxine, I had this incredible dream that I had sex with a movie cast. Cowboys. <laughs> it's crazy. And I stopped taking it because it gave me night terrors. And as soon as I stopped taking it, bam, it was it was fine. So Amy says, you saw urogyne, and because of your history with endo and results from your pelvic ultrasound, she thinks your IC is gyno-related. I have a hysterectomy scheduled on August 26th. I'm excited and scared all at the same time. I've been in a flare since January. So, okay, um, getting a little bit more information would be really, really good, Amy. Um, specifically, does she think maybe it's a fibroid pushing on your bladder? Uh, wouldn't be surprising and, and hysterectomy would be absolutely the correct thing to do because when we remove that fibroid uh, and remove that pressure on the bladder, things get better. Um, there is a wonderful website called Hyster Sisters, uh, hystersisters.com. Please go there, sign up. They give you lots of lists on how to prepare for that hysterectomy. They talk about the different procedures, like I had a laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy. Um, and if you want to talk about it, I'd be happy to talk to you offline, hon. Feel free to call. Tanya, you think it's called Nutiva? I, you know, I, it would be worth trying. I mean, Tanya, for all we know, maybe you're allergic to coconut. I don't know. But I would definitely try a different brand. And I really liked, I mean, I was really scary to try anything down there because I have a history of vulvodynia. And I got to say, I've, so far I've used half of this. Anytime I feel any prickling down there at all, I go swab it with coconut oil. And it's working like a charm. Tanya says, can you take pre-leaf every day? My euro, my euro says three times a day. You, you know, you don't take it like candy. Please don't take it like candy and just, you know, yeah, you know, swab it, swallow it all day. You really be firm in taking it when you're going to eat something that's risky. Um, you know, because if you take too much calcium, you could potentially trigger calcium-based kidney stones. But patients have used it, many, many patients have used it safely for decades. But there are a few random patients who have problems with it. Some patients cannot take it because they're prone to calcium-based kidney stones. Every now and then you see another, uh, another side effect, but it's, it's pretty rare. It's definitely considered the most safe and reliable one out there. But of course, we are all unique and different, and there's no way I can tell you it's going to be safe for you. It's talking with your doctor and trying, trying stuff. Um, Edith, the coconut oil that I use is this one, emerald. Emerald coconut oil. Pure extra virgin coconut oil, cold pressed. Love it. I'm not eating dessert right now. My dessert should just be smelling this. It smells so good. Oh my God. Cynthia says she completely agree. Had total vaginal hysterectomy and oof in 94. I've wondered whether this has any link with the IC. Well, it's going to have two potential links. It's going to have uh, the link number one is the, the loss of estrogen, which is going to make your bladder more vulnerable, combined with the trauma of the surgery on your pelvic floor. Becky on YouTube says that you can get refined and unrefined coconut oil, and the refined coconut oil does not smell. Becky asked, uh, sitting on a yoga ball help? I have so much trouble sitting at work. It messes up my hips and pelvic floor. Girl, man, I am just always trying new things. I am going from sitting to standing. All I can tell you is my typical, my, my lazy boy, executive office chair is the worst. If I sit in that for 30 minutes when I get up, man, I'm walking. I, I, I'm my, I have so much pain in my hips and my legs. I do not understand it. And I'm in good shape, guys. I'm in really good shape. 
So it's life is weird, right? Cynthia says CB, CBD, she believes CBD drops have helped your IC tremendously. You still take your MP, two capsules daily, your thoughts. Hey, man, I say go for it. If CBD helps you, that's great. You just got to look at the source of CB of the CBD. Make sure you look at the testing results from the company and make sure that it's not tainted in any way by pesticides. Uh, whether it's hemp CBD or medical marijuana CD, we've got to make sure that it's pesticide free. And so if that company has testing results on their website, you're gold. If the company doesn't, I would ask why and call them. You need some written guarantees that their product is not contaminated with pesticides and rat poisons and things like that. Hello, Marie from Florida. You're borrowing your friend's phone today. Thank you for your great advice. You're very welcome, Marie. And you're very, very welcome. Okay, says so I drink lots of water all day long and go pee two to three times, so then I am up every two hours at night disrupting your sleep. Any idea? Well, when you get, okay, so okay, here's, here's a question. Are you getting up at night because you have pain or are you getting up at night because you have urgency? How you answer that is going to kind of determine my answer there. So if you're getting up, when I get up at night, it's usually because of pain, uh, because I have central sensitization. So it takes very little fluid in my bladder to trigger pain for me. Okay. So the, the, the first thing I want to know, Kay, is what is the quality and health of your skin? And are you suffering from any estrogen atrophy? The second thing that we're going to look at is there is there anything 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 in your day in your daily life that is provoking and irritating your bladder wall? Are you taking a multivitamin every day? Are you drinking coffee, soda, lemonade, green tea, black tea? Those are the things that nighttime urination is often a direct reflection of something during the day that irritated your bladder. So that would be the second thing that I would be looking at. Um, if you have estrogen atrophy using an estrogen product that would help bulk up your tissues, bulk up the protective lining in your bladder so that it can defend itself from urine, makes total sense. You watch everything that you watch carefully. The other thing I guess I would really want to know is, has anybody looked in your bladder? What do they see in your bladder? Do you have Hunter's lesions? If you have untreated Hunter's lesions, that could explain it. I mean, you could also have some type. Okay, so yes, you have bladder wall. And is it, is it mild, moderate, or severe? <laughs> Your doctor said, um, oh dear, that's not helpful. I don't, uh, Frequent, okay, so you've got two different nerve groups in your bladder. You've got the alpha afferent nerves in your bladder wall. Those are the nerves that tend to control frequency urgency. And then you've got the C fiber, which is the pain nerve in your bladder. So the fact that you're having pain tells me that your C fiber is involved. Maybe you've got some central sensitization. Well, okay. Plus you've got pelvic floor and levator, ain't I like I do? Okay, how old are you? Have you ever gone through chemotherapy? And guys, she's on um, she's on YouTube, which is why I'm looking downwards. Let me let me move this up. Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn, I do too, actually. I could have I, I could have gone to medical school. I didn't. I didn't all my, you know, when I got my pharmacology degree, all my peers went to medical school. I didn't. 
I was more interested in research. At the time. So you're 79. All right. So, all right. So, okay. There is absolutely no doubt that your 79 year old bladder cannot defend itself like your 29 year old bladder. You have to be at this point in time in extreme estrogen atrophy. We call that the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. Is if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, then so is your urethra and so is your bladder. And underneath it all, if your skin, if your bladder's dry, any your urine's going to be more irritating. That could be why you're getting up all the time. Are you using any estrogen creams at all? Becky says, I'm really grateful to have you here to give us the info that our doctors don't. Yeah, they just don't have time and they don't have the interest in it like we do. I mean, well, okay. So, okay. In my opinion, you need to go back to your doctor and you need to have them look at the quality and health of your skin. And if you're showing extreme estro estrogen atrophy on the outside, then you're showing extreme estrogen atrophy probably on the inside. And before you go, uh, I have a video on our website called The Estrogen Chat. I would encourage you to watch that. That would help. But what I really need you to do is I need you to Google G is in George, S is in Sam, M is in menopause, GSM. That's short for genito urinary syndrome of menopause. Okay, you have very dry skin. So think about it this way, Kay. Think about how bad dry mouth feels. You know, when your mouth is so dry, you can barely talk and you're swirling water in it because you're desperately trying to help it. That's what you're having down below. Your mucous membranes you know, your vulva and your vagina is a mucous membrane. Your urethra and your bladder are mucous membrane covered organs. You've got extremely dry tissue down there and they're meant to be moist. You know, one of the ways to distinguish that is a lot of people who have GSM or also known as estrogen atrophy is that you have burning, at, you have burning externally while you're peeing that you can have pain while you're peeing on your urethra because your urethra is dry, but it's the, it's the irritating urine crossing the dry vulva that often triggers terrible pain. And we call it urine burn. And usually that's because there's, there's not enough mucus on the vulva to protect that skin from whatever irritants are in your urine. So you got to work on that very dry skin, hun. And, and if you can use the estrogen cream, that would be reasonable. But, you know, this is where, again, I mean, listen, this could be, this just plain coconut oil might be really helpful for you down there. I, I mean, I'm uh, 30 years younger than you. No, 20 years younger than you. I use this daily. Sometimes a couple of times a day to stay moist. And it's so important because I went into total estrogen atrophy two years ago after my hysterectomy. And I'm telling you that skin down there does not like to be dry. You're welcome to call me, hun. If you want to call me tomorrow, um, you know, just go to the IC network website, icnetwork.org, icnetwork.org. And uh, you can get our phone number on the website. It's on every page. You're welcome to give a phone call. I'd be happy to talk with you, hon. See if we can investigate this a little bit more. And in the meantime, you, you just got to understand because your tissue is so freaking dry, you got to be perfect with your diet right now. You cannot be doing any coffee, any soda, anything. Your bladder and your body simply cannot defend itself from that right now. You're absolutely welcome to give me a call, Kay. Really, we happy to work. But I want you to go over to our website, the IC Network, and I want you to watch the video 
the estrogen chat first. Before you call me, I want you to watch that because that'll explain it. It's like a it's like a 10 minute video. Okay, then we'll figure it out. I'll try to explain it to you. Okay. All right, Facebook. Back on Facebook. Don't Dominica says there's a lot of new research coming out on IBS. Dr. Pimente, a pioneer in this field, is studying the link between IBS and bacteria. His theory is that in a lot of people, IBS is triggered by food poisoning, even food poisoning that's brief and pass on fast, resulting in the production of antibiotic bodies that could damage the enteric nervous system. This could be relevant for IC as well. I think that that is an incredibly sound theory, and I hope he pursues that. You know, I had my first frequency urgency in seventh grade, but I had my first IBS right around the same time. And God knows we've all had food poisoning. And you know what? That's honey, Dominica. I'm sorry for calling you honey. That's that's triggering a memory for me. It's triggering a research study that I read. God, it's right on the tip of my tongue here. Hmm. You watch, it'll come to me as soon as we sign off for the day. CC, my, can, can my IC be causing extreme pain on your legs and feet? Anyone feeling the same? Your bladder is not going to cause pain in your legs and your feet. Your muscles and nerves will. So if you have extreme pain in your legs and your feet, the odds are you probably have extremely tight pelvic floor muscles. Uh, if you have tingling in your feet, um, you, that also could be muscles so tight they're they're uh, pressing on nerves. If you're having sciatica, that comes from very tight piriformis muscles. So that's not your bladder causing that. That's your muscles or your nerves causing that leg and feet pain. Thank you, Beatrix. Jamie, hydroxyzine can cause muscle tick and twitching. Yeah, probably. Wouldn't surprise me. Beatrix, how long does it take for a flare to heal? A mild flare can be done in 24 hours. Very severe flare can take months. You got to remember the bladder is the slowest healing organ in the body, people. It takes two weeks for one cell to be replaced. If you, so if you suffered significant cellular damage like I did, when I was 32 and had that pool accident and I had the equivalent of a chemo burn. I, my first diagnosis was chemical cystitis. Um, uh, I was hamburger from the ureters down. Long story. I've told the story before many times. Um, I didn't know about diet. I was drinking a, qu a quarter cranberry juice every day, not having a clue that the acid was making the initial injury much, much worse. Uh, and certainly impairing healing. You know, every time you have a soda, you set yourself back two weeks worth of healing for your bladder wall. It's all about creating an environment for to support healing. I mean, that's why, that's why I often say to patients, I say, I don't want you to think of this as a quote and disease, because of course, for most of you, it's not a disease process. Think of it as an injury. If you're thinking you've got an incurable disease, you go, you, what you say to yourself is, I'm not going to let this rob me of something I enjoy. I'm not going to let this disease rob me of something I enjoy. I'm going to, I'm going to, damn it, I'm going to have that coffee and soda every day. How dare this try to take some, away something I enjoy? Okay. You can rationalize doing bad things when you're thinking it's an incurable disease. But when you're thinking that it's actually an injury and you use, it's like, okay, I've got an ulcer on my hand. Would I pour coffee and tea on it every day? Uh, no. My job is to create an environment that will support healing. So when you think about it that way, it should completely changes the way you're thinking about this. Completely changes the way that you're thinking about this. Hey, man, you guys have stuck around for two and a half hours. I think it's time for a giveaway. And my giveaway today is going to be... A bottle of Piora. Anybody want a bottle of Piora? 
I am happy to send it to you as a gift. I just want you to call me back and tell me what you think of it. So, 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 let us do... I'm gonna do a. I'm gonna do an icy test. I'm doing an icy test for you. Here's my test. The first person, and Tanya, let me come back to that Zyrtec question. The first person to name the 2018 IC Doctor of the Year is going to get this. Go ahead and guess now. Who was the 2018, 2017, 2016, 2015, 2014? Okay, Donna Townsend. <laughs> Donna Townsend got it first. The answer is Robert Evans. All right, my dear, you need to email me your address. Address. I think you have before, but just email it to me again. I got your name on this bottle. And you know what? Kay, Carolyn, the three of you. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, I can't do it. Wait, no, 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 hold on. Okay, I can't do that. Um, Because we had Facebook people too. So the first person who guessed it on Facebook is Laura Phoenix. Laura Phoenix. Laura Phoenix, I'm going to send you one too. Laura Phoenix, would you email me? icnetwork at math.com your address, and I'm going to send you a Piora too, okay? Alrighty then. Alrighty then. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do more IC trivia questions for you. Uh, as our contest winners. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, somebody asked about Zyrtec. Somebody asked about over-the-counter antihistamines. So would another antihistamine work like Zyrtec? Benadryl is good, but on the list for dementia, may, may be milder than hydroxyzine. So Tanya, there was an alert issued for Zyrtec earlier this spring. Zyrtec is known for causing something called Zyrtec discontinuation syndrome. If you take Zyrtec for more than, I don't even know how quickly, a couple of days maybe, uh, what they have found is that Zyrtec, like Cymbalta and some other medications, have a very, uh, I don't know if dangerous to write it, is the right word, a very, very severe effect when you go off of the medication. It's called a discontinuation syndrome. So I personally wouldn't touch that Zyrtec with a 10 foot pole. I would Google it, learn about that, and, and maybe talk with your doctor about something else. I mean, the hydroxyzine on the dementia. So, so Tanya on the dementia research and the cognitive decline research, the antihistamines and the skeletal muscle relaxants were not implicated. They did not show the same risk. So the hydroxyzine would be a, would probably be a better bet than the Zyrtec because it at least doesn't have a discontinuation syndrome. And I, and I speak from experience with that because I used it off and on for many years. In fact, they want me on it again right now for my vulvodynia. And I'm like, yeah, I won't do it every day, but I will do it every now and then. Uh, trap on, on YouTube says, your tech was very bad for me. Dried you completely from head to toe. Uh, Lisa says, lately you've been having muscle, muscular jerking. Any connection to IC? Lisa, is it, is it body wide? Is it throughout your whole body? Or is it just, girl, man, we gotta figure out what is going on with you. This is upsetting. Uh, I mean, I have a tremor. Sorry guys, I'm looking down at YouTube. 
I, I got to move it back. So when you see me looking down, that's just because I'm looking down at YouTube. I mean, I have a trimmer that I inherited. I have a essential trimmer. And so you will occasionally see me doing this. If my neck gets really tight, I trimmer. If I squat for a long period of time, my legs start to shake and tremor. Um, but there are some medications that can also cause tremor like that. So I would also be looking at your meds, hon. Tell your doctor and just sit down and talk with your pharmacist about it. See if they might have any insight based upon the meds you're taking. Uh, as an example, there is a medication for gastroparesis that is well, not, well, well known to cause tremors. And they, sometimes they're really, really bad. And so it could be a medical, a medication side effect, hon. Edith says, is a vegan diet bad for IC? I think a simple, fresh, healthy diet is the best for IC. I think getting away from all processed, adulterated foods is important. I think a diet that is has very simple food in it is the way to go. Going back to the way we ate a thousand years ago rather than this crazy consumer driven fake food that we're all being exposed to. My only hesitation with a vegan diet, Edith, is that when is that protein is essential yeah. for tissue healing. Now if you ask me scientifically to prove that, I wouldn't be able to tell you to do that. How, you know, how to do that other than by diving into some research. But I think it's really, really important for you to create the, the cleanest environment you can create in your body. Organic fruits and vegetables, simple, fresh, healthy meat, you know, range fed meat, not processed with any antibiotics. That's what I go for, antibiotic-free, eggs. Uh, I also like to get stuff from local local farms rather than national chains. I do meat, um, uh, but are you, you, you're you not going to see me eating McDonald's hamburger or eating, you know, Jimmy Dean sausage. I want to know where my meat comes from. So I'm very careful about that. Sherry says, gabapentin causes tremors and ticks. Pat, Pat T on YouTube says, you have to consume a well-planned vegan diet. It's quite doable. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like eating meat every day. I don't like eating a lot of red meat at all. Um, I like to have a, a, a strong protein like three or four times uh, a week. Uh, we're having chili rellenos for dinner tonight, along with refried beans. All right. It's, I'm going to say, I, I say this every time, and I'm looking at you. You have done nothing wrong. This is not your fault. I don't want you carrying any shame or any blame because you have IC and pelvic pain. You're no different than someone who was hit by a car. You deserve that. You deserve love, kindness, compassion from your family and friends. But seriously, we got to be real here. Our self-talk is terrible. It's terrible. You know what I mean. We start thinking that we're damaged goods. We start thinking that we're unlovable. We start thinking that we're unworthy. We start thinking that we're being punished by God. All sorts of crazy stuff going through our heads because that's what pain does. That is what pain does. You are not damaged goods. You belong here. And that is all the more relevant after yesterday. You belong. We need you. Your family needs you. You all know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I try not to talk about politics, so I'm going to say it. You belong. When you think about pain processing and pain, this is what we know. 
This is what we know. We have a, I have a great freaking book. Everybody should buy. When it hurts down there by Dr. Angie Storr. 15 Proven Techniques to Alleviate Pelvic Pain. This book by far has the best discussion about pelvic pain processing. As an example, let me show you a picture. Look at this picture. This is an example, sorry, I'm on my ball. <laughs> Um, of all the nerves in your pelvis that all meet in the spine. One of the reasons why it's hard to tell your doctor where your pain is, is because these pain signals merge. For say, and, 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 you know, I know I ranted about that earlier. It's like, okay, guys, seriously, you need to be able to tell your doctor where your pain is, at least be able to tell them, is it inside of your body or outside of your body, right? But it's hard when all these nerves merge. Well, where do these nerves go? They go from your pelvis to your spinal cord. They go from your spinal cord to your lower brain. At your lower brain, your body begins the process of sorting that pain message. It's called the spinal gate. It only lets the most important pain message through. So if you step on a nail, believe me, that pain message is going right through to your middle brain and your upper brain. But five days later, if you fall and break your arm, you're not going to feel the freaking nail. You're going to feel your arm because it only lets the most important and urgent pain messages through. So one of the first things you can do to help reduce your pain is to just is to provide a distraction. <laughs> slap your thigh. Look, when you slap your thigh, you're forcing your brain to pay attention to that rather than your bladder. I flew to London 12 well I think it was 10 hours 12 hours with a TENS unit on my leg in a severe flare. I'm still amazed that I did that. And I had a TENS unit on my leg and I would turn it up when the pain got bad just to try to provide a distraction. So that's one of the first things you can do to try to modulate this pain. Now, when that urgent pain goes from the lower brain to the midbrain, that is where context happens. That is where your brain goes, is this, is this urgent pain, life-threatening pain, or is this okay pain? So if this pain is accompanied by laughter, like if you're on a roller coaster and you get thrown onto the side of the car and you hurt your ribs, but you're laughing, your brain goes, oh, this must not be severe pain, and it will de-emphasize it. But if your pain is accompanied by tears and crying and anxiety, your brain goes, uh-oh, my life might be in jeopardy, and your brain intensifies it. So the second thing you have to do is start giving yourself positive messages and laughter. Your homework from me to you today is to watch 30 minutes of funny videos on YouTube. Do it. Laughter, mod laughter helps your brain provide context. Cat videos, I watch, before I go to bed, at least 30 minutes of videos. At least 30 minutes. And it's always hard because being on the internet late at night is tricky because if you're on Twitter and somebody has something really disgusting, and you see something you never ever want to see, then it's hard to go to sleep. So I would only recommend that you be on YouTube and please only pick funny videos, okay? The other thing that is so incredibly important 
is we got to change your language on the inside and how you're thinking because there is hope. There is always hope. But if you're hiding in a room, reading Facebook groups, getting yourself wired up, spinning in a circle with depression and sadness, you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel bad because your brain is intensifying that. But if you open up the drapes, let the sun shine in, walk outside, let the fresh air stimulate your, your senses, let the wind hit your hair, give yourself a change of perspective, watch a butterfly, watch the birds, something, anything. We need positive stimulation here. I need you to get out of your bedroom and up and moving. Up and moving. And I need you to start doing affirmations. And when I think back, when my IC was the worst, the blessing of my life was a lady at an audio tape bookstore who gave me an audio, audio tape of Norman Vincent Peale. And he wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. And that was when my brain changed for the better because he said, you know, I mean, he basically explained that, that when you focus on, when you give your brain something positive, encouraging to focus on and look forward to, it completely changes stuff. And we know, we now know how that works in brain science and brain chemistry. So pick your affirmations, be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. Um, every day in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. When you're thinking about going to the doctor, I don't want you to let your brain go into, oh, he won't help me. It'll never work. Nothing will work. For God's sake, don't do that. What I want you to do instead is in your brain, I want you to rehearse the appointment from that, mo from that moment. You're going to have a good night. You're going to wake up in the morning. You're going to take a shower. You're going to wash your hair. You're going to put your makeup on if you wear makeup. You're going to have an easy trip to the doctor. The traffic is going to be great. You're going to walk into the doctor's office. They're going to greet you wonderfully. They are happy to see you. You are happy to see them. You're going to have a wonderful discussion with the doctor. He's going to give you several new things that might help you. You're going to walk out of that appointment with a smile on your face and hope in your heart and hope in your heart. Rehearse it in your brain. Don't rehearse failure, rehearse success. And when you catch yourself dwelling on the nobody can help me, I say bullshit. There's always hope. And we have so much hope in IC right now because of the subtyping. We are helping so many more people now figure out why they're not responding to therapy. And it's a good time to have, I mean, it's never a good time to have IC, and I admit that, but compared to 20 years ago, if you're going to have IC, be thankful it's, it's in 2019 because we have so many more resources available. It's, life is good, and you're important, and we need you. Your family needs you. We need you but it's hard. You're going to, this is the hardest you've ever worked in your life. So please practice reward therapy. Whenever you go to the doctor, do something to reward yourself for going to the doctor. I don't care what it is. I just don't want it to be something stupid. You know, like, please don't, don't go drink a diet Pepsi. <laughs> you know, go get a vanilla milkshake. That's not going to hurt your bladder. Go get a hot cookie, sugar cookie. That's not going to hurt your bladder. Go sit in the bathtub, read your favorite book. reward yourself. Becky says, I went to a good training recently about attitude and this really stuck with me. Worrying is negative goal setting. I like that. Worrying is negative goal setting. And as Donna says, um, Donna and I have been working on IC Awareness Month. And if you go to icawareness.org, you can see our, our, our first images for this year, which I just did two nights ago. And our, cam our campaign theme for this year is we are stronger together. Whenever you come to these support group meetings, I want this to be your safe place. 
I want you to feel comforted. I want you to feel welcomed. I want you to feel educated. I want you to feel empowered. I want you to tell me when I'm doing it right. I want you to tell me when I'm doing it wrong. If I say something that's not right, please tell me. Because in the end, we are doing this together. We are doing this together. And you have many, many IC brothers and sisters, and we are here for you. All right. Okay, my friends, listen, it is 6.30. I need to go fix chili reinos for my parents. And I've got to decide if I'm going to go to trivia night or not. Hmm, I don't know. I've been working all day. So I'm going to say good night. May you sleep well tonight. May your bladder feel wonderful. May you have a good day tomorrow. And please, if you can, come follow me on, on Twitter, ICN Jill. On YouTube, I see and Jill. Um, and on Facebook, I don't know what the hell Facebook is doing. I think Facebook is weird. Uh, please, but please um, uh, like our page on Facebook so that you can get noticed when we go on. And I just want you all to understand, too, that I'm going to be switching and we're going to be moving over to Twitch TV to do this. But I'm going to do them a lot more frequently, maybe even every day. I may stream for an hour a day, two hours a day, live support group. We'll see. Okay. All right, my friends. See you later. And as always, if you hear anything in these chats that is unusual and different, please talk to your doctor about it first. Only your doctor can give you medical advice. I cannot. Okay. See you later. Goodbye, YouTube.